Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Uh, today we are looking at uh, House Stark and I've just seen behind me is definitely not House Stark. Uh, apologies for that, I, um, maybe I'll try and change that a bit later. But uh, this is the penultimate, I think, in uh, in a series through the the great houses of the North, or at least the intriguing, the interesting houses of the North. Um, I will do... Well, actually, I'll probably do two more. I think I will do the watch, the night's watch as well, um, which technically isn't a house, but I think it's probably worth us uh, looking at for a week. And then, as I suggested last time, we'll just do a roundup of uh, all of the other houses, just the rest of the north, which, um, I don't know, might take some time. Uh, but today we are looking at um, House Stark. Now, House Stark... Uh, I'm almost tempted to sort of skate through all of the history um, for the simple reason that I think we know a huge amount about it. But the, the fact is that actually we don't. Now, the, the thing which is hanging over all of this is the fact that we have um, a Song of Ice and Fire. Instinctively, we have this feeling that the two big important houses are the Targaryens and the Starks, which they are. But we know so much more, ironically, about, certainly in the last uh, few hundred years, about the Targaryens than we do the Starks. We have, for the Targaryens, we've got fire and blood, um, and also the world of ice and fire focuses so much more on the Targaryens, the Targaryen kings, than it does on the Starks. And we, to the extent that we don't really even have a full family tree for the Starks for the, even the last 300 years, let alone going further back than that. So, although we know a huge amount about the Starks, it's perhaps not as much, given the history that there is there, not as much as we might first think. There are some big gaps in our knowledge and understanding, and that, I think, is deliberate on George R. R. Martin's part. So, that said... What is the history? Well, they are a first men family, meaning that they will have come across at some point uh, with all of the first men um, in the Dawn Age invading Westeros from the south. Uh, they will have been around there um, when the pact was signed, and we have our few thousand years of history um, of peace, effectively, after the pact was signed, the Age of Heroes, and then came the Long Night. And on the other side of the Long Night, we have the building of the Wall and the establishment of Winterfell and the establishment of House Stark. Now, it may well be that there were precursors to House Stark. I mean, obviously, uh, Brandon the Builder, Brand the Builder, who we're told is the, the founding father of House Stark, obviously he had ancestors. So it may well be that there was a house of some uh, sort before that. But as far as we're concerned, the story starts after the Long Night. And the Starks have therefore been connected right from the very beginning with not just the Long Night, but also the Wall and Winterfell. Um, we can talk about Winterfell um, uh, in more depth if you want to, but it's probably worth pointing out that when it started, although we talk about you know, Bran the Builder established Winterfell, we think of Winterfell as this castle. When it started, it wasn't. It, it was, there was uh, the Godswood, there was the first keep perhaps, and there was the Winterfell crypt. So that is what Winterfell started as. And so many of the other great castles of the realm, they were planned out. They were built uh, in, in a period of time, the Red Keep being the classic example, but also you get things like Storm's End, hasn't changed huge amounts over the years. The Eyrie, similarly, uh, Castly Rock, yes, they've sort of burrowed in and gone deeper, uh, but it's fundamentally the same. Winterfell has changed and evolved over the years. Bits have been added on centuries later, still more centuries later. If you read those opening chapters of Book One, A Game of Thrones, the the way that Winterfell is described is is almost anthropomorphic. We're, we're 
told that the the hot water that runs around the castle it's it's like blood in veins that runs through this castle um and we're we're shown um a castle that it's yes it all fits together but it's not planned to happen together. You go in the first floor somewhere and then you can come out on the third floor somewhere else. It's not all on one level. They didn't flatten it all out. It's massive. Uh, what, what it is now, It's at least it's massive, but it's perhaps even more massive underground. We will definitely be talking about the Winterfell crypts a bit later, I've got some questions about them, but there are multiple layers of these crypts this is where the Starks are buried. Not just the kings, not just the Stark lords, they're the ones who get the statues, yes, uh, but then all of the Starks get buried in there too. And you've got perhaps, again, this depends, this back in the mists of time, so the exact timings, it depends on who you talk to, but perhaps 8,000 years of history, 8,000 years of Starks buried under Winterfell. So you get. Um, perhaps more than any other family and their castle, this huge connection between the Starks and their land and their castle. They have been buried there year after year, century after century, millennium after millennium. This is not, as you've probably seen as we've been going through the other northern houses, this is not unique. There are... Um, Several other houses have the House Bolton is another classic example. They have crypts, they bury theirs, uh, they're dead under their castle. So, this is not unique for the Starks, uh, but this, this bond between them and where they are, there must always be a Stark and Winterfell. This is unique to them. Now, the other thing which is always connected to them in some way is the wall. First of all, Bran the Builder, the, the person who apparently founded House Stark, he apparently also was uh, involved in building the wall. So these two things are inextricably connected. And all the way right to the very beginning, the Starks had a an active interest in the wall. Stark um, uh, sons would head up to the wall on a regular basis. They cared about its upkeep. Um, the Stark connection to the wall is strong. And you immediately start to just think there is a connection here between the Starks and the purpose of building that wall. They were established, they were connected to Winterfell, they were connected to the wall just after the end of the first long night. And the wall, and very probably Winterfell as well, are there as this defence against whatever the next uh, long night is or whenever that happens. So that's the establishment of House Stark. We then find over the next millennia, uh, they expand their lands, basically. We think of the Starks as being the kings of winter, the kings of the north, uh, but they, they weren't. They started out, like everyone else, with relatively small land area, and then we just get this list one after another the the marsh kings the warg kings the red kings they fall to house stark and house stark's influence and power expands out across the north and again time and time again they make these alliances with other uh, kings in the area uh, to deal with threats from outside there's various when you get these legends of Gendel and Gorm um, and other attacks from the north, uh, then House Stark links up with House Umber or someone else to defeat them. When the Andals came and they started attacking uh, from the south and wanting to, they'd taken most of the south of Westeros, now they were wanting to take the north, the Starks and the Boltons joined forces to repel them. So um, they, their tactics over time, this wasn't a, you know, we have one conquering king who's taken over everything, their tactics, this took 
so many years for them to get to the point that we think of them as being the the overarching kings of the north but they did get there and for the most part there are some exceptions house bolton being the most obvious for the most part the northern houses accepted the Starks as kings, often because the Starks uh, either married into those houses in some way, House Reed is a good example of that, or the Starks benevolently gave this house its land. This is what happened with the Mandalays. Um, this is what happened um, over on uh, Bear Island with House Mormont. The Starks gave those houses those lands, and so those houses then became loyal to House Stark. And uh, we just get a few um, random uh, sort of stories, really, of the Starks coming through the ages. We, we hear of lots of Brandon Starks. This is the the most popular name for the Starks, but there's also, there are Theons, there are Rickards, repeated numbers of these. Um, we have, to pick a random example out, we have Brandon the Shipwright, who decided to build lots of ships and head off to the West to see what's off in the West. He didn't come back. His successor, Brandon the Burner, burnt all of the shipyards in the North, which is why, incidentally, the North doesn't really have a, an established naval presence. So uh, all of this took them up to the point that we know where we have Torren Stark, um, who we remember as being the king who knelt. Now, at this time, the hundreds of petty kingdoms across Westeros had worked their way down to seven, basically, and the Targaryens attacked. And this was clearly an existential threat uh, in a way that, pretty much everyone realized because they defeated House Dundon, they defeated um, House Hoare, this, th there was the Field of Fire, um, ancient houses that were as old as the Starks, or in some cases even older, fell overnight to the Targaryens. And so the Starks had to figure out what to do. Their first instinct was to go march an army down south, and they did get uh, a long way down south, but then they saw the dragons, and we've gone into you know, the details of what perhaps this might mean. Was there some uh, meeting of minds between Torren Stark with his understanding of the threat from the north and uh, Aegon the Conqueror, who clearly has had this dream, this vision about a threat from the north? Was there some kind of understanding between the two of them? We don't know. Perhaps, but we don't know. In any event, what happened was after a night's negotiations, the two kings met, Torren Stark knelt, and uh, he accepted the new title of Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. He was no longer a king, and he headed back up north. Now, we're told after this that Torren Stark's sons weren't that happy with this. Perhaps they had not seen the dragons. Perhaps they had not realised the threat. Perhaps Torren Stark didn't tell them the details of everything that he'd discussed. But they weren't particularly happy. Nevertheless, very roughly for the first century or so of Targaryen rule, the Starks pretty much just carried on as they were before. There's... Um, I mean, it's, it's probably worth just sort of saying that the Targaryens let them, the Targaryens left them alone. Um, I do have a video on this in the works um, about how this dynamic um, might have worked if you have Aegon the Conqueror, who um, apparently thought that there was a threat to all of Westeros coming from the north, and then he proceeded in his 30-something year reign not to visit the north, uh, or at least not to visit Winterfell until his very last progress. Uh, so I've got a video on that to come out, but it's this was this was the case, really. The, the Targaryens didn't 
interfere. They didn't visit. They got as far as White Harbour, but never really as far as Winterfell. The Starks just carried on ruling. And the next, to be fair, the next couple of rulers, uh, Aenys and then Maegor, they had other things on their mind rather than caring about what's happening with the Starks. So it was only with Jaehaerys and Alicent that suddenly we get this re-engagement of the North. And uh, Alaric, who was the uh, Lord Stark at the time, we're told that he um, he, he was quite hard uh, to start with. He was very suspicious to start with. Alison kind of won him over. Um, Jaehaerys too. Obviously, the dragons will have helped. Their commitment to helping the Night's Watch also will have played into this. Although it's it's worth noting that the new gift, I, I, I gave one perspective on what happened with the new gift last time when we were talking about House Umber. Here's another perspective on this. So the, the Targaryens, Alison in particular is driving this, decide that the, the Night's Watch need more support. They need more money. Uh, the way that basically they had been getting their income before was from what was called the gift or Brandon's gift, which is the area of uh, land just south of the wall. Um, just like with any Lord's lands, then they would be paying their tithe effectively, paying their way. Um, if they would get some produce of whatever it is, a, a proportion of that went to the wall to support the Night's Watch. That's roughly how the system worked. But Alison thought they need more, so let's give them more land. Let's chop off another chunk of land south of that, the original gift, another chunk of land. And it was a significant chunk of land. The Umbers were obviously unhappy because this was their land being given away. But the Starks had another concern as well. It was more of a security concern, which was that if House Umber weren't looking after that land, uh, would the Night's Watch really be looking after it? Well, not really, because the Night's Watch stand on the wall and look northwards. Uh, they don't ever really come south. They just they just wait. People will bring them stuff from the south, but their focus is and should be looking northwards. So the Starks were a bit concerned. They thought, well, give it a give it a few years. This whole stretch of land here is going to be largely unprotected uh, and probably it's not going to be particularly useful. Uh, it's not going to be providing much by means of support to the Night's Watch. And they they made this point to the Targaryens. The Targaryens didn't really care. Apparently, they even there's letters that have been kept all the way down in the citadel of their concerns about this but it didn't matter. And the Starks were proven right. This is a little bit of a tangent on this, but the Starks were proven right. When you get to uh, any of the characters going through that part of the land, when Bran and co were heading up there, uh, when Tyrion and Jon were heading through there, this section, this area of land is just, it's basically described as pretty much abandoned. Um, and uh, it's the Starks were right. This is not actually helping them. Anyway, regardless, uh, after that, uh, the, uh, the the Targaryens, Viserys seems not to have, again, paid huge amounts of attention to the North. The Starks just got on with run, uh, running their own lives. And then we have the Dance of the Dragons. Now, this is something we can talk about this in a bit, but the, the Craig and Stark, a young, new young uh, Stark Lord uh, was in charge then. And Gisaris Targaryen was sent up on behalf of Team Black to get the, uh, the Starks on board. Now, um, if you sort of trace your history through, there is a, um, a line of logic that you can see, I think it's in the world of Ice and Fire, that suggests that this might well be the case, is that the Starks having been disgruntled by what happened with Jaehaerys taking this land, the new gift from them, and basically ignoring them, uh, they then decided um, uh, that they were going to be 
at when we got the Great Council, where after Jeheris, at the end of Jeheris's rule, they were actually one of a few, very few houses who actually voted against Viserys to take power because uh, Viserys was Jeheris's pick. Um, they they decided to go for Lenor, um, which gave them a connection in with House Velaryon, which sort of carried on over to when we get to the Dance of the Dragons, and which side of this are they going to go with House Targaryen, uh, or the ones who are linked in with House Velaryon as well. It, perhaps that's just a little bit too uh, sort of political for, for the Starks, but it's it's certainly an argument for why they might have um, decided to join forces with Team Black rather than Team Green. Um, the other is probably that Team Green just sent them a letter. Team Black sent them their heir, uh, basically. So that is a lot better. And they, they are agreed on... And more persuasive and they agreed lots of things potentially happened during that visit uh, but the outcome was they agreed what was known as the pact of ice and fire now the pact of ice and fire uh, was an agreement that Jaceris's firstborn daughter would marry um, uh, Cregan's firstborn son and this would tie the two houses together and in return the North would support Team Black. And this support came in two tranches, basically. First of all, you have what was known as the Winter Wolves. Um, the Starks said to the Mandalays, can you gather together some soldiers and head down south now and join in the battle? And they became really quite a, an important and effective unit in the actual war. But then winter started to hit and Cregan decided to pull together, you'll remember in the north, a lot of places, it, I mean, it can be very harsh uh, in the winter, a lot of places that they just, they think there might not be enough food to feed everyone. And so the people who otherwise might struggle, uh, he pulls them together and say, right, we're heading down south. So he heads down south with this kind of mixed brigade of, uh, of uh, yes, soldiers but also some younger and some older men as well and into this army that arrives just at the very end of the war and Cregan arrives just in time for what we call the hour of the wolf because for a couple of weeks he was everybody else had fought themselves to a standstill and House Stark arrived with basically a whole new fresh army and they could take control of King's Landing and decide what happens after that. Cregan suddenly had huge amounts of power. And uh, it'll be interesting to see exactly how they go this route on House of the Dragon. But in the books, it's only really uh, people like Corliss and Laris and people like that who worked behind the scenes to get basically surrenders from absolutely everybody which prevented the Starks from just carrying on the war. Because Craig and Stark had come with an army expecting to have to fight and then seems to have been denied the opportunity. Uh, he, however, does get a wife out of this. His first wife had died, and um, who was, I think, a Norrie, uh, and he marries uh, uh, Alison Blackwood. And they head back up north. Now, what follows then, he seems to live a long time, Craig and Stark, but what follows him is an extended succession crisis for House Stark. It gets very complicated, and we don't have all of the uh, context and detail that we do for the effective never-ending Targaryen succession crises that, that we have. Um, but what comes out from the bottom end of that is Rickard Stark, a um, hundred or so years later, and he is the father of Ned and Brandon and Lyanna and Benjamin. And that's where we get to the story that we know. I think I won't sort of carry on. I think we all know what happens next after that. Um, 
a few overarching things about House Stark, though. I've already talked about the uh, the link to Winterfell, but they, George R. Martin does this quite a lot with houses. They have a very distinctive look, how Stark do. Um, they've got uh, sort of dark brown hair, grey eyes, long faces, we're told. Uh, some of them can be very icy um, and melancholy, although some of them have what is known as wolf blood, um, which makes them... Um, well, as the name would imply, Brandon Stark, Ned's older brother, was one of those. Uh, quick, t uh, quick tempered. Now, um, how Stark have these sayings associated with them? Uh, the, the North remembers, but also there must always be a Stark in Winterfell. Um, and and that's not just a phrase for them it's not just a phrase they actively do this and so through history you will see that there is always when most of the stark family goes away they always keep at least one stark left in winterfell who is known as the stark in winterfell um and this we can talk about whether there are other layers to this, but this at the very least does keep up this connection between the Starks and Winterfell. If people believe that there must always be a Stark and Winterfell, then that just sort of bolsters their overall claim to be uh, ruling uh, the lands. And the other thing to note about Winterfell and how it manages to survive in a way that many others haven't. Uh, as a strategic advantage, it is built over some hot springs. Now, the, the winter in the north can be incredibly harsh. Now, and these hot springs, this isn't just like, oh, there's like a nice little bit of bubbling water coming up there. This is significant to the extent that we can have hot water running through the walls of the the main castle keeping everybody warm you can have if you go into the godswood then uh, the lake that you get hot water bubbling up so you can actually have a warm bath going on there they have got glass houses they have got a, a winter garden effectively where they can grow food all year through this is a huge advantage over everywhere else because in the north it's quite hard to be growing crops at the best of times but during winter particularly if a winter lasts two three four years you can't grow anything the only people really in the north who can grow things are the starks and so that provides them with this um, uh, advantage over pretty much every other house Okay, I think by way of an introduction, that's probably enough. Um, uh, let's have a quick look in the chat. Uh, I had, I think I had one just before I came on air. Let me just have a quick um, look at that. Uh, yes, this was from Commander Ray saying, Hello, Robert. Uh, super excited. I love the Starks and have lots of questions about Liana. I hope you don't mind. I've been waiting a while to ask them. Uh, well, uh, I, I got them. Thank you very much. I hope you don't mind. I've sort of trimmed them down. Um, otherwise, we'd be talking about Liana uh, for quite some time. Uh, but uh, yes, they are coming. So do not worry. Um, I will be answering them. Uh, Ranabir Mitra saying, Salutations, Robert. Uh, salutations to you too. Joe Magician speculates that Lady Stone heart will be passing her life to rob stark hence danny's vision in Carth. your thoughts um so joe i mean always got time for joe magician's theories he speculates that lady stoneheart will pass her life to rob stark hence danny's vision in Carth. now rob stark is dead and gone um so uh he I, i'm not entirely sure of this theory um my, I'm. I don't know if we know the exact details of of how fire whites work yet. Is the, the the biggest issue I've got going on here, in in as much as, um, the Beric obviously he sort of decided to end it by passing his life on to uh, Lady Stoneheart, but does that mean that she has to do the same thing now? her character arc can only carry on through to um 
uh, I think, through to the point at which she gets satisfaction that the revenge for the ills done to her family has been dealt. Uh, and or she has discovered that actually not all of those ills happened in the first place. Um, Bran and Rickon weren't actually killed. Uh, so is she going to give her life to Rob Stark? I don't think so, unless... Joe's come up with some uh, clever theory I'm unaware of because Rob has gone. Uh, but could she give it to somebody else? It's possible. But you do have to remember that she is down in the Riverlands. And a lot of the theories to do with Lady Stoneheart involve her doing stuff up in the north. That's still a very long uh, way to go. And uh, she is focused on what's happening in the Riverlands at the moment. Her focus is on trying to find Arya and then getting revenge on uh, the phrase. So that's where her focus remains. Um, we'll have to wait and see after that. Mara Lee. Hi there, Mara. Great to see you saying just a show of love and support. You are the best. I appreciate that hugely. Thank you very much. Um, right. I think that is... Um, Oh, Joe Magician is in the chat. Um, uh, I in in that case, Joe, I'm not entirely sure what you're or Matt. I'm not entirely sure what that um, theory was that I probably uh, uh, misunderstood. Um, but yes, you did. You do point out in the chat. Uh, Rob Sans and Bran all have red, reddish auburn to red hair, whereas I and Rickon have the classic Stark look. That's that's quite a, I think, an important point. If you're imagining the Stark children, is that when we're thinking of what a Stark looks like, and George R. Martin, he does put a lot of emphasis on what these different families all look like. A lot of those kids don't look like Starks. Uh, it has to be said. John looks like a Stark. Arya looks like a Stark, but the others, um, not not so much. Um, Rickon also is a uh, quite Starkish. Um, Suelen and Nas Nascimento. Uh, apologies, I probably. Uh, but you do name there saying no question just a hello from brazil i uh, love your content well thank you uh, it's uh, great to see you uh, hello back to uh, brazil um uh right uh let's go to a question from uh ty farnsworth this is about the crypts of winterfell um Hey, Robert, my question today has to do with the crypt of Winterfell. We are told that each of the Starks has their own grave site expected within the crypt, and the deeper parts, specifically the lost sections, are well below the entrance. What happens when the crypt is completely filled with the bodies of Starks, and will we ever see a need to expand the crypts in the books? As always, thank you for everything. Well, um, I, mean, I, th I think the short answer on this is that I don't think we're going to need see this need in the books. I think we've reached the uh the the end point of the need for the the stark crypts in as much as the kids themselves the stark children they've got their graves there already uh, they have played in them uh we we get them reminiscing about uh playing in there as children um so uh, the way that this seems to be structured is the oldest bit is right at the bottom uh, and then there's another level and then another level we don't uh, don't know exactly quite how deep all of this goes uh, but even to get to that topmost level is a long way down so if they did need to they could first of all just keep on going uh, sort of uh, sideways as it were but they could always dig another level um, above the top level that they have right now um, because at the current top level uh, in order to get to uh, where uh, the um, the statues of Liana and, and Brandon and Rickard are, for example, you've got to walk all the way past a whole load of these uh, these other Stark lords. Uh, so it's very clear that they're at sort of at the far end. So I think the short answer is we're not going to see a need for any more excavations under their um, the the intriguing question that we don't have an answer to is the extent to which the people when they started building it 
had an idea of how much space they were going to need. Uh, all we know is that they went very deep um, and then they started working back up towards the surface. Um, Joe Magician, perhaps answering what this uh, theory is, saying, since Stoneheart is undead uh, and she sees Rob as her only possible child, she may try to bring him back, back no matter what state his body is in. Oh, interesting. Um, well, I mean, I think they'd have to find it first. Um, uh, I mean, I... Trust you, you've got good answers behind all of this. Uh, I I think that uh, one of the key things about Kat, particularly when she was talking to Rob, was that she does not believe that Arya is dead. Um, and when we get later on in the book, Lady Stoneheart has evidence that Arya is not dead. So she is now placing her hope, I think, on Arya rather than... Uh, reanimating Rob. But yes, the idea of uh, Rob coming back with a wolf's head, uh, horrific, and I'm sure George R. Martin would love it. Um, Raven's Oath. Did Balin Greyjoy have respect for Theon Stark? Uh, always rubbed wrong that a son of Greyjoy would use a Stark name, or did Stark use a Greyjoy name? Oh, interesting question. So yeah, I mentioned earlier that one of the names which you you get in you go back in the stark family tree is theon now is this a is this a greyjoy family name that the stark stole or a stark family name that the greyjoy stole or i think a clue to the fact that actually the ironborn are um first men because all of these names that we have uh, they are used across the north. We we get Johns and um, I mean Bran is a very Starkish name, uh, but we get uh, similar names used by all of the main families. We get Rickards and Roberts and things like that across all of these different families. So I think that is just a subtle way for George R. R. Martin to be telling us that uh, the Ironborn, yes, they're their own culture, but they are linked across to the north. They came across from the north. Northern Tommy saying, could Catelyn have born bastards in Sansa, Bran and Rickon? It has to be asked. Not really there. <laughs> Thank you for your devotion. Um, no, uh, I don't think so. That, there's there's no indication whatsoever that, uh, that that's the case. This is just... Tullys often have red hair and they got that gene. Um, right, let's go. Um, uh, Luna Cascade asking, saying, greetings from a rainy USA day. Is USA day? Um, uh, why were the old kings of Winterfell featured so prominently in prophetic dreams? If we're talking about the, the dreams of characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, um, the, the Starks in particular, they, they are connected in with the, uh, the Winterfell crypts because this is Winterfell to them. So again, we think of the castle, but for the Starks, Winterfell is the crypts and you get this whenever characters go in there you'll find that the starks always feel at home this is this is where they belong and nobody else likes it robert baratheon is say why do you have to bury liana in a place like this uh, theon uh, just doesn't like the he feels that the the statues are staring at him uh, john who Yes, he's got Stark blood, but um, he's, I suppose, technically a Targaryen. He always has the dreams where he's feeling they're saying, "You don't. There's no place for you here. You don't belong here." So this is this is used as a marker of Starkdom, and it's also we will get onto the the other potential role of the the Crypts of Winterfell in a little bit, um, uh, but it's also I think a bit of foreshadowing about what might come. Um, question from 
uh, Welchures saying uh, maybe the Ironborn migrated from the Neck when it was flooded by the Children of the Forest. Yeah, it's possible, absolutely possible. I mean, I, I will just throw out a random, random Ironborn theory. Um, if you go to Old Wick, where you get their um, their ancient place, um, the Bones of Naga, uh, which you uh, this is where they sort of choose. Uh, the the king and things like that, it's a holy place for them. Um, they they think of the bones of Naga as these kind of like big uh, white um, bones sticking up out of the ground. They think this is the you know, sea dragon, basically. Um, but the way they're described could be dead weirwood trees. Um, uh, We'll cover that when we get over to, to the Iron Islands. But it's a possibility that that they were weirwood trees and that perhaps when uh, when you're talking about they came over from uh, from the neck, um, because the Iron Islands, I've not got the map up obviously here right now, but the Iron Islands are actually quite close to the north. Perhaps the um, hammer of the waters, as well as destroying a land bridge down connecting Westeros and Essos, also destroyed the, whatever was connecting the Iron Islands to the mainland. Um, so perhaps that's uh, what was going on there. Um, as I say, we'll come back to that uh, when we're talking about the Ironborn. Um, Mike Hanna saying, curious about the Stark kids' connection with wolves's and Stark's warg or green seeing abilities. Do they all have these abilities to different extents? Um, yeah, interesting question. I did, I will connect this with some questions I got if I can find them from my uh, patrons, because I had a few patrons asking very similar questions. Mara Lee saying, we know that Jon Snow, Arya Stark, Bran Stark and Rickon Stark have warging abilities. Historically, has there been mentioned of other members of House Stark having warging abilities? Andrew Roberts saying, how many Starks before the current lot had walking abilities? Maybe Craig and Stark in House of the, House of the Dragon. Corvus Corax um, saying, Eddard's children and John are all wargs, and those genes must have come from somewhere, but I don't recall another mention of a King of Winter or Lord Stark with these abilities. Um, so what's going on? And the short answer is that we, we come back, as we did before, to the fact that we haven't got all of the details of all of these characters. So we do not know uh, whether there's any... We, we don't get a specific mention of this this king of, you know, this king of winter was a, was a wolf. But the hints are there that the statues have got wolves next to them, so they are associated with wolves. Um, uh, this... Uh, the way that Ned happily s allows me, not happy, he's a bit grumpy about it, uh, but he allows his children to be adopting direwolves seems to imply that he thinks that that something about the Starks um, means that actually having wolves as pets is a, a reasonable idea. Because, you know, I can't, if, if you just stop for one moment, take a step back. Could you imagine any other father going to? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, so my children—they've uh, now got wolves as their pets. Um, th there's there's a hint of something going on. So we have no direct evidence, but I think the hints are there. Um, that going back now, where in the family tree, we don't know, uh, but. Uh, probably dotted around to and fro. Um, uh, Aegon Dragonborn saying, what is George R. R. Martin's point of highlighting Targaryen history when Stark lore is predominantly mythical and vague in historical accounts? Well, oh, there, I mean, I think there's two layers to this, really. One of, one of them... Well, three layers. Probably he just enjoys writing about Targaryens, let's be honest. Uh, secondly, uh, why might he um, uh, talk about the Targaryens rather than the Starks more? 
because if he gave us a full detailed history of House Stark, probably it'd be quite spoilery about what's going on, uh, what happened in the the long, the first long night, things like that. Um, if we understood the details of all of that, probably this would give away a huge amount of the background in a way that he could write a lot about the Targaryens without giving away that background. So I think that's the second layer. The third is is. Um, uh, slightly more highfalutin literary, um, which is that he he does work his way through this kind of meta idea of what can we trust in terms of passing down information. We have very broadly two modes of writing that he's given us, one of which is the point of view chapters. And this is what A Song of Ice and Fire is written in. It's what Duncan Egg is written in. We see things through someone's eyes, which means that we understand what they're going through, but also there's a lot going on that they don't un they don't get. Uh, we see this in lots of chapters. He he loves using this. My favourite example, I've talked about it many times, is the Arya, um, the, uh, I think it's the last Arya, chapter when she's in Harren Hall in the Clash of Kings um, and she's there with Roose Bolton and things are going on all around her that she's not got the foggiest idea of what's going on. She she doesn't know. She she meets this, uh, this fray child who's crying about the fact that he was supposed to be marrying a princess and that's, that's now not going to happen. And she's not got the foggiest idea. Actually, she's the princess that, that he was supposed to be marrying. He doesn't know that either. Um, we, she's there witnessing um, uh, Roose Bolton sending off... Uh, Stark loyalist forces uh, on a mission. She's she doesn't realise that this is part of him weakening the Stark loyalist forces uh, as a as a way of sort of uh, trying to get in with Tywin. She doesn't understand so much of what's going on in that chapter. In fact, we don't understand it until like the second or third time we read it through, um, because that's referring to things which haven't happened yet in the book. But this is the limit of the POV, the personal, the lived experience. The second type of writing he does is this history. We have got the world of ice and fire, we've got fire and blood, and that is trying to say it. This is setting out real world. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. But the more you get into it, the more you see that there's gaps there. We do not know what happened here. Uh, you know, this this source tells us that, this source tells us this. Um, and clearly there are some characters who are being... Uh, cast in a, a particular light because of the prejudices of the person writing that history. Uh, so he's giving us these two different um, approaches to truth, really, at a very high level here, that plays out within the story as well, because we have the lived experiences being represented by the weirwood trees, because um, uh, that's they are taking, we're told, we're taking the memories, the lives of uh, the, the the children of the forest to go up into them and they are experiencing everything. This is Bran when he's getting through the magic that we were truly experiencing these things for himself. And then we get the maesters who are recording history. Um, and they, they will come up with a eventually a, a record of what happened, which may or may not have elements of the truth in it. Uh, so he's playing with this idea all the way through at many levels of these two different types of truth uh, that we're uh, working on, um, which was quite a long little the digression away from the original question is why, why is he writing so much about the Targaryens and not so much about the Starks? Um, it's because they're these, they're, they're showcasing these two different styles as much as anything else. The Stark history is an oral history. The Stark history is told by old man. This is where we get the stories and the, and the histories. It's passed down from generation to generation. Uh, the Targaryen history is being kept in books. So they're, they're two different. It's a it's quite a sort of a literary approach that he's taken to this, but it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating one. Um, 
let's go to a question from um, uh, Royal Torres. I'm, I do apologize. I'm probably mispronouncing your name here. Uh, saying, why were there so few Starks around at the time of Robert's Rebellion, considering that they had been rulers for, lo for so long? Uh, there are not many branches. Well, this was what I was saying earlier, is that we get, there's a long period of basically succession crises um, with the Starks, uh, where the, the last Stark standing really is uh, Rickard Stark. And we're not told this, but the implication is that this Stark line of succession is not, it's not necessarily a straightforward one. It's not just male preference primogenitor, so there might be something else uh, going on. Um, uh, because it seems inconceivable if this was just male preference primogenitor it seems inconceivable that it could have gone through all that time and then never have been or us never to have heard of a queen of winter um just kings of winter if you take the british royal family as a random example everyone can name you know one two three queens of england uh and that was through male preference primogenitor it happened that those there are female rulers through male preference primogeniture it's just less likely than a male so that's the um uh, the slight wrinkle we have and we do not know the exact information on that but um you do get a conversation and i've got a i've got a video coming out tomorrow rob stark's will what this means uh in that, when Rob is talking to Cat before before he gets his will signed off, basically, or witnessed, um, he talks to his mother because he knows that his mother's going to have a problem with what he's going to do. And he's basically, he's decided he's going to um, legitimise John and make John his heir. And Cat uh, says, yeah, but Arya's still alive. And Rob goes, yeah, I don't believe that really. Uh, and then she says, yeah, but okay, so there are, you know, there, there, there's somebody else next in line. And then she she goes through and says, okay, so uh, Rickard didn't have any siblings, but his father did. And then some one of them married House Royce, and then they had three daughters, and they married. And, and so she, she actually can work out where the next in line is it's quite complicated uh, but she can work out where next in line so there is always a next in line is the short answer but um why there are not many within that particular branch of the family tree is because uh, they've had um this whole series of uh, as i say succession crises um stark heirs died uh we will see some of this in Duncan Egg. The next Duncan Egg story, uh, they're going up to Winterfell. The working title is The She-Wolves of Winterfell. And basically the situation is lots of Stark men have died and the women are left in Winterfell having this political battle about who's who's going to take over. And that's when Duncan Egg enter. Uh, so that's the setup of that. Um, and so... Some of them died with the Greyjoys, some of the uh, attacks on, against the Greyjoys, some of them with wildling incursions, uh, but lots of them died over the, the preceding hundred years or so before the story that we have. Um, relaxed uh, like a cat, uh, saying, I'm a fairly new fan and I've been enjoying watching your live streams. Uh, from three years ago. Uh, the idea of Bran being king sounds kind of menacing to me. Um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is obviously the how they ended it on the TV show. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all of the will Bran be king logic unless you want me to. Um, but uh, is it menacing? I mean, he will be be so powerful by then um, uh, if he gets to the end of the books 
he will be able to see anything anywhere, which basically is kind of surveillance state if you think about it. Um, but one thing I would say is that um, you always have to remember that where this started for George R. R. Martin was with Bran. Uh, wherever else this story has gone, this genesis was with Bran. The first thought he had was uh, that image of the uh, the dead direwolf and the direwolf pups, uh, and Bran uh, being then from Bran's perspective. Now, um, then he went, okay, so he needs to have some siblings, and then the story expanded out from that. So if it depends, his first his first answer is um, it starts with Bran should, on pure storytelling lines, end with Bran in some way. Um Reflective rambling, uh, picking up a question for Luna Cascade. Thank you. I love it when people do this. Saying, who was the most dishonorable Stark and why? Um, oh, good question. Um, I think I'll throw that one to the chat, actually, um, in terms of dishonorable Starks. Um, let me, I will, I'll read out a few of the, the thoughts you might have there. Uh, Joe Magician saying the Night King, the Night. You, I assume you mean the Knights King. Um, uh, yeah. So, if you consider that he is a Stark, then uh, you would probably have to go with that one. Um, Billy Chop saying the Grey Stark that chose to rebel with the Boltons. Yep, that's a good one. Um, uh, Craigan's uncle suggesting Raven's Oath. Um, uh, sorry, Raven's Oath suggesting Craigan's uncle. Uh, Martin S. Uh, actually, the same question very much. Was there ever a nasty evil Stark, a Joffrey or Ramsay type figure, if you will? Um, uh, off topic, but regarding evil figures, Celine or Lanfear in the Wheel of Time is awesome in the book and the show were like, yes, she is. Um, uh, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, we'll pick up the other questions in um, here. Uh, Joe Magician with a good point saying a lot of the North consider Torrin Stark a coward. Um, I don't think um, most people would, uh, outside of the, the, the North, would say that. Um, right, I think I'm going to, if you don't mind, for just one moment, I am going to... Um have to let my dog out because he's been whining at me and he clearly needs to go out. So um, I am going to um, very quickly absent myself. Talk amongst yourselves for just one moment. Right. Uh, apologies about that. Um, <laughs> Andrew K saying, just make sure to let him in the room for a cameo after. I I, I would do, uh, but that I have this um, I have this green screen behind me, which is uh, actually quite um, annoying because I have to clamber through it in order to let him out, um, and I might have to clamber back out in order to close the door later because otherwise it's a little bit cold here winter has come um uh, nicole nark saying why the picture of rainera uh simply because um i forgot to upload a picture of uh, ned stark shall we shall we uh as we're doing this way we, we can uh let's see whether we can amend the the background and let's find Let's find a nice picture of Ned Stark, shall we? Here we go. Right. Hopefully, we've now got Ned Stark in the background. 
Um, let's go to uh, Curse Bell Arena saying, uh, picking up for Daniel Dipka. Thank you very much. Saying, if the others get close enough to Winterfell, do you think the water pipe through the castle will freeze and maybe blow the castle up a bit? Uh, wow, that's um, it's. Uh, it's not something I've ever thought of. Um, my my take is that um, this is more about it being a defensive structure. So um, my feeling is that Winterfell was built, the wall was built as the primary defensive structure against the others. Winterfell was built as the sort of the, the defensive hub behind the front line. Now, in order for that to be able to always operate then they needed to put that somewhere on top of the um uh, the hot springs so my take is that this uh, the hot springs will probably survive um but what you will find is that it's already getting very cold up in uh winterfell and um uh it the it within the castle itself, it's staying warm still uh, when you're thinking about the the, late, the last chapters in, in the story that we have. Uh, Mike Hanna, do you think Ice's backstory is important? Um, so Ice being the sword, uh, the, the ceremonial Valyrian steel sword owned by uh, House Stark, is its backstory important? I know lots of people have said... Uh, or speculated about it uh my take is probably no in as much as that sword itself uh that sword is valyrian steel which means that that sword came from uh high valyria uh or from valyria uh when valyria was around and as such it probably doesn't go all the way back to the first long night uh, which means that it is just a cool Valyrian steel sword. Um, does it mean it's not important? No, it is important. Um, uh, it is the the sword for House Stark, but um, it's not. It doesn't have some specific purpose over and above all of that. Okay, I'm going to quickly shut the door. Um, I'll be back in one second. Right, hopefully distraction's over. This is why I need minions. I should, I should have minions. Um, okay, let's go to... Um, uh, Steve Ash, Lerner Turner, interesting question. Is it possible the Starks have at least a bit of Children of the Forest blood as part of the pact at the time of Bran the Builder? And that's why they can walk. Um, well, I'll get th I'll get to the timings in a little bit. Um, might they have a bit of Children of the Forest Blood? Possibly, but I think there are stronger candidates elsewhere. Like, for example, when we were looking at House Reed, I think that there's a very strong possibility that there is some uh, Children of the Forest Blood there. But the Starks, um, I. I think for the Starks, it's a lot more that they they represent all of the North. So most of the North they have intermarried with in one way or another. They have intermarried with House Reed, so I suppose you could argue via that that there is a small amount of children of the forest. But it's more that almost all of the main houses of the North have at some point married into the Stark family tree, so they are representatives of all of the North, rather than being specific. Um, I missed um, Mr. Super Chat. Oh, uh, no, I got that one. Thank you very much, Ranabir. Um, 
Right, I think that's me caught up in the chat for the moment. Um, uh, where would Net saying Dawn is Lightbringer? I think. I mean, uh, th I've I've heard people um, uh, suggest this. Let's get let's, let's talk about this for a moment. Um, so, Lightbringer is the Sword of Azora High. Let's let's break this down. So we Lightbringer is the sort of Azora High. We have um the legend of Azora High, which it always has to be said is that we this is a frustrating legend for anybody trying to understand how to actually defeat the others. Because the legend of Azora High is 90% uh, and this is how he forged his sword and 10% anything else. So Clearly, the sword is important, um, and it's obviously quite a memorable, if gruesome story, but um, we don't know exactly what happened with it. Now, could ice be um, Lightbringer? Well, Lightbringer has to be the, the sword of Azora High. It is fiery. Um, and I think both of those are marks against this. Uh, well, three marks against this being uh, Lightbringer. The first being, as, as far as we're, we're aware, it's not fiery and, and never has been. There is no, we're not told of any scorch marks on it or anything that implies that it ever was fiery. Secondly, it is not actually made as um, uh, really a weapon of war it obviously can be uh, but this is a this is a huge uh, very very long uh, two-handed sword which is this is why ned uses it for beheadings uh, it's not actually designed really as a um a sword for use much in combat it is for justice and then thirdly because this is made from valyrian steel we can be reasonably certain that this came from the valyrian freehold which we can be reasonably certain means that it happened after the first long night which means that it, we can be reasonably certain it wasn't uh, azora high sword if i had to guess what azora high's sword is then dawn um the the sword of house dane makes a whole lot more sense um Andrew Kay saying, I suspect the uh, the Warging came from the Warg King conquest, more likely who um, who themselves had more children of the forest links. Yeah, so the Warg King was one of the many kings that uh, the Starks um, got rid of, and it's entirely possible, yes, in, intermarriage through that, that might lead to the Warging. Um, uh, let's... I think I had another question here somewhere. Oh, Kaius Ballerina saying, I think ice is Narsil. It'll be the sword reforged. Um, yeah, so I I mean, I've had, actually, I've had this where I've had uh, Matt on on here. We've, we've discussed this. I'm, I'm sure of it, or maybe it was on someone else's channel. Um, I absolutely get this idea of um, we should reforge uh, ice and use this to be fighting the others. But my very practical brain always goes, but why would you want to do that when you've now got two Valyrian steel swords you could use rather than one? Um, if you're wanting to be fighting the others, unless you know that there's a particular reason why that particular sword has to be reforged in that particular way, I would personally take the two swords myself. Um, Martin S. Was there ever a magically proficient Stark? Well, um, the only one that sort of immediately, uh, other than the current generation, if you're talking about all the warging and uh, green seeing and things like that, other than that, the only one that really springs to mind is the very first Stark, Bran the Builder. Because um, Bran the Builder was involved in the building of the Wall and was involved in the building of Winterfell, and both of those places almost certainly are magical in some way. Um, the Wall we know is. Now, was he involved in that magic, or did the magic come from the Children of the Forest stay? Say, we don't know. 
this is thousands of years ago, but he was definitely involved in some magical building. Um, let's go to uh, of Walchures saying, thanks for tonight. I'll go to sleep now. Adieu. Adieu to you too. Um, and uh, Dark Horse saying, what do you think the plan was for the Stark kids? Who was Rob supposed to marry? Uh, Ned says to Bran he will be Rob's bannerman, creating a house. Um, uh, yes, well, who he was to marry is is a, a slightly different issue. So Bran, the, the idea, Ned's idea clearly was that uh, Rob would inherit from him. Um, they'd not really, we'd been not told exactly before this who Ned might have thought he should marry but all the implications I that we have or the hints we have that Ned was just wanting to keep his head down uh, he after Robert's Rebellion he went up to Winterfell and although there was one war he got called back down for he basically stayed in the north after that and didn't get involved in politics didn't sort of head down to kingsland he could have i mean I, I i think we all know that he could have had a seat on robert baratheon's small council right from the very beginning if he wanted to but he didn't he wanted to retreat up to winterfell and just stay away so my my best guess is that his his thought would probably have been well, Rob should probably marry some highborn northern um, uh, daughter of a northern lord, uh, which is what most Starks through history had done. Bran, yes, he can he can marry off uh, a, a, a daughter of another uh, a noble lord or something, and he can he can be a, a loyal bannerman to Rob. So that's probably the the plan. Um, uh, Willie Biggs 2000 any Stark bad guys come to mind yeah we did talk about that a little bit um, earlier so I'm not going to go back over that one um, Carl Karsnark asking about Ned's bones how they tie into the crypts and associated magic we'll be talking about I've got some questions from my patrons about that so we'll get on to them in a moment let's, let's go to some questions from my patrons um, uh, Johnny Targs asking about the 13th commander of Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, who turns out to be the Night's King. Was he a Stark? Uh, the text seems to allude to it, but it may be that George R. R. Martin will never confirm it. Would love to know your thoughts. Well, um, my thoughts are that we, at the moment, we don't have the information to say. Most in the main story of A Song of Ice and Fire, um, uh, I should have counted them, but there's there's not that many. Let, well, actually, I'll do this. I know um, I, I do quite enjoy doing uh, the quick word searches while we're uh, on air. Uh, this is searching for Night's King. Um, in all of A Song of Ice and Fire, there are 10 mentions of the Night's King. And of these, uh, one, two, three, four, um, five, six, um, yeah, six of them are Bran remembering old man stories. Uh, so that is the majority and of what we have about in the main um a song of ice and fire is just bran remembering old man's stories and when you then look across to the world of ice and fire the mention of the um the knight's king there there's a, a very clear echo i think this is george R. R. martin actually having a little bit of fun he does he's got quite an impish sense of humor sometimes um old man uh when she's telling the story, uh, she uh, she says, uh, "Oh, the night knight, knight's king, um, 
uh, he um, some some said that he was. Uh, let's see whether I can. Yeah, so Old Nan says, some say he was a Bolton, some say a Magna out of Skagos, some say an Umber, Flint or Norrie. Uh, some would believe he was a Woodfoot, uh, but he never was. He was a Stark, um, uh, the brother of the man who brought him down. She always pinched Bran on the nose then. He would never forget it. He was a Stark of Winterfell, and who can say? Mayhaps his name was Brandon. Maybe, mayhaps he slept in this very bed, in this very room. Um, she's telling the story. And the echo of the and the end of the story is, and maybe he was a Stark. And then you go across to the world of ice and fire, and it's almost the exact same thing. But imagine a Maester says it, and a Maester says, "Well, maybe this was a Bolton." Some people say it was a Bolton. Some say he was a Flint. Some people say it was this. Um, some people say it might even have been a Stark. It really depends on who's telling the story, um, and. That, I think, is just George R. Martin saying, and who was telling the story there? Old Man. And so Old Man tells the story uh, with it being uh, a Stark. Uh, should we think, therefore, that he is on that basis, that he was definitely a Stark? Well, not necessarily. Old Man also tells a story about um, the, uh, the Titan of Bravos, to she told the story to Sansa about uh, the Titan of Bravos uh, would sort of wade out into the sea, come to Bravos's defense, and it would eat highborn girls uh, when it was hungry. Um, at which point she would maybe pinch Sansa's nose again. I can't remember what it was, but this was how old man told stories. She would tell the story and then she would bring something uh, home in on something which would scare that particular child about the story. So, um, we have no specific evidence. That said, could it have been a Stark? I think there's a fair to middling chance it was. Um, the, the Stark connection to the wall is very strong, uh, so the chance of it being a, uh, the Lord Commander being a Stark in the first place is pretty high. The Stark connection to the, the, the fence against the, the next long night or the return of the others is strong thematically, so the idea that uh, it could be a Stark who became the Night's King, who saw this, um, uh, what was a, a, apparently a female other, uh, that that works really well. So uh, we have no direct evidence, uh, but uh, thematically it definitely makes a lot of, of sense. Um Corvus Art, how many near misses of a Stark ch Targ child were there? I can think of Jace's promised daughter that never was. Uh, were there others? Will Egg be propositioned by a she-wolf? Um, uh, well, uh, yes, so there, that's the only real, and, until obviously we get to Rhaegar and Lyanna, that's the only real um, Stark Targaryen link. The the Mandalays had a couple. Incidentally, they uh, they also got a marriage pact uh, around then, um, and also had one a little bit earlier. And neither of them actually came off. Um, so, uh, would Egg be propositioned by She Wolf? I think he's still a little bit too young by the time he gets up there. I think the. Um, if there's any propositioning going on there, it's going to be uh, with Dunk and um, uh, Young Nan, if that's what she's called at the time. Um, I think that's probably the most likely. So no, I don't think so. But um, don't forget with Egg that he still did marry First Men uh, uh, ancestry. Uh, he married a Blackwood. So um, if you're just wanting First Men ancestry, then that happened anyway. Uh, Pate Pate saying Ned liked Rhaegar, yet Ned's family died because of him. Uh, was your first, first, first super chat. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, Ned, I mean, I don't know whether like was the right word. Um, uh, he, he only thought of him in good terms. 
it's fair to say, when he did think of him, he would say, he would be thinking, oh, that doesn't sound like Rhaegar. Frequenting brothels, that doesn't sound like Rhaegar. Uh, that kind of thing. He he, um, he seemed to hold Rhaegar in some reasonably high regard. That doesn't necessarily mean that he liked him, uh, but it it is another just random bit of anecdotal evidence that this person did not go ahead and abduct um, Ned's sister uh, because otherwise Ned would have a very different set of thoughts about Rhaegar. Um, but yes, Ned's father and brother dying for uh, over a misunderstanding of what Rhaegar did is um, there, there's an irony in that. Um, Joe Magician, my favourite tinfoil about the Starks. They have the Knight's Queen trapped in the bottom of the crypts underneath the bottomless pool in the Godswood. How wrong am I? <laughs> um, I mean, it's one of those things that we can't we can't possibly um, uh, say. But I will give you my counter there because the bottom of the crypts. For those who are unaware, the the very oldest part of the Winterfell crypts, we're told that there there was, there was a cave in, um, and some of it's inaccessible, which is odd, because you would have first of all this was this was holy ground to the Starks. If there had been, they'd have sorted that out. They'd have figured it out. But also, the it seems in reasonably good condition. Uh, all in all, and so that seems a little bit weird. So I've always assumed that this was an intentional shutting off the bottom bit of the um, the Winterfell crypts, which has led some people to say, well, what is down there? One idea here is that that's where the Night's Queen is, and we don't hear of what happens to the Night's Queen. That's, that's the curious thing about... the. Or, one of the many curious things about that story is that we hear about the Knights King getting um, dealt with, uh, but he's the he's the human member of the Knights Watch who fell under her spell. What happened to her? We're not really told the full uh, sort of what happened to her afterwards uh, story. Um, so, could she have been trapped under there? Possibly. Um, could we have something like dragon eggs under there? Again, possibly. The Horn of Winter? Possibly. My take is that actually what that is is simply beyond there. We're told that any evidence of the uh, who the Night's King was was destroyed. And if he was a Stark, then that would be what that is. Uh, so I also think... And we'll get on to my um, working hypothesis about the uh, the ultimate purpose of the um, the crypts a little bit later in the stream when we have a question about it. But my take is that the dead Starks that were there um, they came into battle when uh, the Knights King was around, and then that bit had to be shut off. And then uh, the 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 Stark army was rebuilt, if that makes sense. Um, okay, let's go to a question from Matthew Hawkins. When Ned Stark discovered that Catelyn had taken Tyrion prisoner, thus inflaming tensions with House Lannister, did he miss a trick by not requesting House Manderley send reserve troops to King's Landing by ship? Um... I, th I think the answer is yes. But one of many missed tricks here by Ned. Uh, it's it's noticeable that when Ned goes down, he goes down with his household guard, and just bit by bit by bit, he he gets rid of them. Um, so when Lady Sansa's direwolf gets killed, he sends four of his guard back up to Winterfell to carry the direwolf up so that it could be buried in the lichyard, which is great, but he's got rid of four of his own troops. Um, 
then some of his troops get sent off with Beric Dondarrion. Um, uh, a few more get sent off to um, join, uh, to sort of help out with the uh, the gold cloaks. At one point, uh, he's always just sending his own troops off to do things and the thought never seems to cross his mind maybe i should get a few more troops down here uh, certainly from winterfell he wouldn't be able to uh, because it would take far too long to get people down but yeah by boat from uh, white harbor would have been an option now he would have perhaps he was just of the view that he didn't want to involve anyone else. This was a this was a him thing, uh, and he didn't want to involve the rest of the North in this. In which case, that's just another one of those silly Ned Stark honor things. Um, but uh, yeah, he he definitely missed a trick by not um, uh, replenishing his garrison along the way. Um, I should probably just say for those who don't know, I've been sort of chatting on and off in the chat to. Um, uh, Joe Magician, um, who I don't know whether he's still there, um, but uh, for those who do not know, Joe Magician has got a fantastic YouTube channel, uh, which uh, looks at A Song of Ice and Fire in depth and um, comes out with some um, excellent working theories, uh, which some of them are uh, a little bit, I'm sure he won't mind me saying, some of them are a little bit left field, but they always make you think, and they're always well-researched and well-worked out. Um, and uh, this is, I think, one of those things we we often, within a sort of a, a community like this, we, we can just go with the same thoughts all the time and just try and, oh, it must be this. We haven't got any new, new books, new information, so this is what it is. Uh, and we need these people who can be thinking slightly outside the box, uh, and that is is what Joe Magician brings there. So I would, uh, if you're watching live, I'm sure one of the moderators will put a link to Joe Magician's channel in the chat. Uh, I would highly recommend that you go and check that out. Um, Martin S. Would Catelyn Tully slash Stark have liked Jon Snow more, or at least tolerated him better, had she known that he was not the result of Eddard being unfaithful? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Um, uh, so we're we're told when we see this from her perspective actually it's it's not it's not actually the fact that he she thinks he's ned stark's bastard that's the problem she's really pragmatic about this she thinks all noble lords do this you think a vast majority of noble lords do this uh they'd literally only met each other just a bit ago they'd, they'd known each other for two weeks then he'd headed off to war um and the fact that he he had a bastard child during that time she she was i mean she wasn't okay with it but she understood it it was fine the problem she had was that she was heading off um from you know, she'd just had her child rob um and then she'd headed off up to Winterfell to get settled in this place that she did not know. She'd never been there before. Completely different culture. Um, uh, they I mean they had to build. They had to build a sept for her because that you know there is nowhere even for her to practice her religious faith. Um, and when she got there, she thought, "I'm now arriving here with the new heir to Winterfell," and uh, Ned had arrived with John and told everyone this is my bastard son and he is going to be brought up as part of this family and Catelyn felt that was the insult what she'd wanted was that if Ned had had a bastard child then he would just sort of set him set him up somewhere uh, send him gifts every now and then uh, just keep an eye on him and that would be fine but this um this was always having thrown in her face this uh the, the fact that ned was uh she thinks unfaithful to her and also it was um a challenge to this this heir that she just given birth to um having john snow there as well so had she known that this wasn't ned's child then yes she would have treated him a whole lot better um, Hermione, do you think that George having written about ice dragons will show up in A Song of Ice and Fire somehow? Um, 
possibly. So he he has he's written a he's written a, a story called the Ice Dragon, um, and um, it's I think he has clarified this is not set in the same world of uh, Song of Ice and Fire. And but Ice Dragon imagery has happened quite a lot in. A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, there are stories, are there ice dragons in the north? And uh, uh, I think there's an ice dragon constellation. Um, uh, John has ice dragon symbolism and imagery to him, uh, as you would expect, because he's ice and fire. Um, now, I think that we're not going to see an ice dragon per se, but we are going to thematically see an ice dragon uh which is john stone um uh, username redacted why hadn't a sept been built in winterfell before catelyn surely one would be built to appease pious visiting targs i mean i think there are two answers there which is first of all Targs didn't really visit. Um, we don't have many records of visiting Targs, and those that did visit weren't particularly pious. Um, it's uh, it's it's fair to say. Um, I mean, in terms of pious, as in the faith of the seven, uh, Jaehaerys did go up and visit with Alison, but he was the person who put in this doctrine of exceptionalism, which basically said, uh, "Well, all of you people should." Yeah, you follow the faith of the seven, but we're we're above that. <laughs> we we can ignore uh, what the faith says on a few certain matters because we're different. We're Targaryens. We're from Valyria, uh, so they they weren't particularly pious. It has to be said. Um. Right. Let's go. Um, well, actually, just. Uh, as, as I always do randomly at some point, I saw somebody saying, a Frey girl saying, mods are the unsung heroes of live streams. Absolutely. This is your chance. If you are there in the chat, um, uh, show a bit of love to the moderators. They, they do a fantastic uh, job. So uh, just give give them a, just give them some love. Also uh, from me personally, patrons, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is why I prioritise your questions here, because I can't do what I do without your support. So patrons, thank you. Uh, if you would like to support this channel, Patreon is the best way to do that. There is a link down in the description. Okay, let's go with a question from um, Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert. My question is specifically about Sansa. Um, I'm a bit confused about the whole unkiss situation with Sandor Clegane. I'll explain this in just one moment, if you do not know. What is George R. R. Martin trying to show, having Sansa remember something that apparently didn't happen? Okay, so this is fascinating. And if, you, if you've if you missed this when reading the books, there is zero shame in this. Uh, I missed this the first time I read through the books as well. Um, uh, but when it's pointed out to you, it becomes really quite obvious and um, intriguing. Uh, you remember the scene right to um, in towards the end of Clash of Kings. We have the Battle of the Blackwater. Uh, Sandor Clegane gets affected by the fire. We know that he's got a, a, a problem. Um, uh, let's say a problem. He's got... Uh, basically uh, um, post-traumatic stress connected with fire um, and the wildfire and the fighting and everything just gets to him and he rushes off to escape from all of this. He finds himself in Sansa's room and uh, there's a really, it's, it's an odd scene. We obviously see it from her perspective he's drunk and very rough uh, he puts a knife or sword up against her throat demands that she sings a song to him uh, she manages to sing a song not the one he wants um, he pulls the knife away 
Uh, he's basically there sort of saying, you know, I, I could take you with me, but he heads off on his own. The end. Uh, he has up to then, he's he's been um, a character who's not been looking after her in King's Landing, uh, but certainly he's shown a softer side than we first thought. Um, and he's sort of tried to advise her, tried to toughen her up a bit. Um, and he's definitely not been as cruel to her as many of the others around him. There was some sort of a bond growing between the two of them. He heads off. Uh, he obviously stumbles across Arya later on, and then he also forms this sort of bond with her. Now, if you fast forward a little bit, um, you then get... Sansa on I think three separate occasions she thinks back to this when uh, Sandor Clegane the hound came to her and she remembers him kissing her now it's very clear that he didn't but she remembers it now this has led to all sorts of speculation the first thought from people was oh this must just be a mistake. I mean, George R. R. Martin is human. Sometimes he might make a mistake. Um, but it turns out um, that it wasn't. He's been asked about this a couple of times, and this is what he says. He says, uh, you will see in A Storm of Swords and later volumes that Sansa remembers the hound kissing her the night he came to her bedroom. But if you look at the scene, he never does. That will eventually mean something, but just now it's a subtle touch, something most of the readers may not even pick up on. And then another time he says, file this one under unreliable narrator and feel free to ponder its meaning. So um, what what is going on here? Well, I, I think everybody's slightly in the dark on this. Uh, George R. Martin has not given us enough uh, to go on here. What it seems very clear is that what what happened and what we saw happening in that first POV was right. It's just her memory that's wrong. So she has misremembered this in some way. Now, why might she have done that? He he says that um, uh, it's uh, it, it will mean something. Now. There, there's so much speculation about this. Uh, one level you could say, is this because she secretly has a crush on him and wishes that he had, and so she kind of Mandela affected it into life, and so in her memory now that he has kissed her? Um, other people have suggested perhaps this might be a trauma response. Perhaps um, he she sees him as a sort of a more safe figure than some other person, perhaps Joffrey, who snuck in and did something worse than that to her. So perhaps this is some sort of a trauma response. And, and then a third, which I find an intriguing uh, possibility, for reasons I'll explain in just one moment, is that perhaps um, she formed some kind of warging bond with him um which has uh in her mind she has connected the intimacy of that with the intimacy of a kiss so um i'm not saying i believe any of them in particular but that last one i did want to just jump off of for just one moment to pick on up on something that will I think be important later in the story in some way, which is that Sansa is a skin changer. She is a warg, like the rest of her siblings. And we often forget that. Georgia Martin has clarified that this is the case. We only haven't seen it because uh, her direwolf lady died so early in this story. Uh, but she does still have those abilities. Now, what if 
we all already know that at least one of her siblings, Bran, is now on a semi-regular basis walking into or skin changing into another human, a very tall, strong other human. What if Sansa, having had no training, not really knowing what she's doing, has somehow managed to get inside the mind, not of a wolf, but of a hound? It's an intriguing possibility, because it's undeniable that the hound softens as this story goes on. He he starts out um, happily killing Micah. Well, not even happily, it's just what he does. He's, he's very... He, he obeys orders from Joffrey. He doesn't think twice about it. Um, but when he comes close to Sansa... There's clearly something about her that awakens a more softer side in him. So, whether whether you believe that or not, Sansa, as a skin changer, as a warg, is, I think, going to have some role in this story somewhere along the line. Um... But if you, if anyone else in the chat, I will very happily pick up. I think this is a mystery. I think George R. Martin has kept it a mystery, and I don't think he's given us enough information to be sure yet on this one. But if anyone does have any theories about what that unkiss might mean, um, then uh, do put it in the chat, and I'll, I'll happily read this out. But Pate Pate saying, don't you think it's odd that uh, it's odd Ned's neutral towards Rhaegar, even though he impregnated his teenage sister? And caught the deaths, uh, caused the deaths of his dad and brother, and war, and all evidence shows Rhaegar never loved her, anyways. Well, um, yes, it's odd, uh, which leads to the implication that the story that we've been told is not the true story. Um, uh, so if he abducted her not out of love, um, and uh, if he um, uh, impregnated her uh, and, you know, against her wishes, um, then, yeah, you would expect Ned to have quite a low opinion of Rhaegar. But he seems, in terms of Rhaegar's morals, he seems to think he's pretty much an upright guy, which seems to imply that perhaps that's not what happened. And it may not be the lovey-dovey marriage that we saw on the TV show, but perhaps they did fall in love. And Ned might not understand it, and he might not have approved, but if he loved his sister, and he did get a chance to talk to her at the end, and if on the basis of that he was he understood clearly that you know, this was a love match in some way, then why not? Um, that I, I think this is George R. Martin giving us hints towards the truth of what actually happened. Uh, let's go to... Um, oh, Joe Magician saying, another one is Brienne. Uh, this is about unreliable narrator, I think. Uh, during her fight at the Inn at the Crossroads, she experiences things in her panic and pain that didn't happen. Brotherhood Without Banners fills her in on the truth later. So um, I, th I think this is a an important point that Georgia Martin uh, plays around with the unreliable narrator than we probably often think. For those who are slightly uncertain about what this whole unreliable narrator thing is, this was very vogue 20, 30 years ago in literary circles. It's now a little bit passe, but um, it was very vogue, this idea of the unreliable narrator, because all through kind of literary history, the the main character, who, whoever's eyes you were seeing the world through, that we could believe it. That was what was happening. Um, but then we got all of these tricksy writers going, ah, but we fooled you uh, because what, what you thought was going on actually wasn't because the person who's telling the story is actually unreliable. Uh, they might be unreliable 
because they're just yeah they're lying to themselves about something it might be that they've got some kind of yeah they've they blanked out a bit of their memory um they might be unreliable for a number of different reasons but suddenly you have to move to a position where you cannot necessarily trust the person through whose eyes you're telling the, the story is being told to you and georgia martin Yes, yeah, so we've got a couple of examples here, clear examples of unreliable narrator, which does give us the idea maybe there might be a few others. Um, uh, certainly when we get um, uh, a character like Circe, we know that she's an unreliable narrator in, in as much as uh, she believes things, but we see her belief. What is potentially see, we see what her belief is and we know better than her what is potentially happening here in this case with Sansa in particular is that she does not know that that's a, a misremembering she thinks it happened and that takes us to another level why does she think that happened did somebody put that thought in her head has she uh, created that thought of as a sort of a response to trying to cover up another thought, what's actually going on there? So that's what the um, the real mystery here is. <coughs> um, Martin S. Was there ever, prior to Jon Snow, a child of one Stark parent and one Targaryen uh, parent? Was there ever a child of a Stark and a Lannister? So um, uh, was there a child of Stark and Targaryen before that? No, at least not that we know of. Um, the the one little asterisk to that be fascinating what they do in House of the Dragon on this one. One of the many um, stories, legends, rumors of what happened when Jaceris went to Winterfell was that he met, fell in love with, perhaps even married Sarah Snow, um, uh, who is a bastard Stark child, um, uh, daughter of um, and might she have had some children i don't know uh i suspect that they're not going to go down that route on the tv show but who knows we'll we'll have to wait and see uh starks and lannisters no we have no record of them um ever marrying or having children um uh, just having a quick flick through uh People's thoughts here on Sansa. Um, Corvus Art saying, I always assumed that Sansa accidentally walked into Sandor and saw the kiss in his mind's eye. Yep, because that's what he was. He went in there asking for a kiss, asking for a kiss, saying he wanted a kiss. Um, and so perhaps she then saw that from his side. Uh, but her memory is of what it was like from her perspective. So it's not quite as straightforward there. Um, uh, Brandilyn Price saying she's having prophetic dreams about them kissing in the future and mixing it up. Uh, yeah, that's another possibility. Um, uh, Mr. Wombo, I just thought it was that every guy has taken advantage of me, so when a bad man doesn't, her brain makes it up or something. Possibly. Um, uh, Uriah Tosh saying, I'm chewing tinfoil around here. Yeah, there's a lot of tinfoil going on, but this is because George R. R. Martin has not told us enough. Uh, so we do have to speculate here. Uh, Astral Inclinant saying uh, she would possible that she was denied her walking with Lady and thus was forced to walk into humans. Um, uh, yeah, it's possibly. Um, Barris Aurelius saying sounds a Love the story of heroic knights saving Damlot, even though she knows and understands a lot of the truth about knights now. Uh, she can't help but want the story. Um, yeah, lots of interesting. Um, uh, you're as Tosh saying, as a dog, Sandor is easily warged. Uh, Corvus Art asking if Bran could have altered her memory. Um, possibly. For what end? Um uh, okay, so lots of really interesting um, uh, suggestions there. As I say, I think with the unkiss, this is something th that we don't know. We we simply do not know. Um, uh, we're waiting to find out what it might mean. If this is something Sansa does with other things as well, 
that will start getting a little bit more concerning. Let's go with um, Lady Pushkin saying, Hi, Robert. Do we get uh, any explanation from Ned as to how Lyanna died and where he found her? Um, yes. Um, we do. Now, Ned's memories with Lyanna, it's always a little bit jumbled, but I think we do need to... Um, draw a very clear line between the fever dream that he had about the Tower of Joy that um, George R. Martin has specifically told us to treat as a fever dream um, and Ned's other memories. So uh, as a as a description of what happened, probably the best we're going to get, this is when uh, quite early on Ned is, Ned is talking to Robert Baratheon and Lyanna comes up, um, and this is what we read. He could still hear, uh, he could hear her still at times. Promise me, she had cried, in a room that smelled of blood and roses. Promise me, Ned. The fever had taken her strength, and her voice had been faint as a whisper. But when he gave her his word, the fear had gone out of his sister's eyes. Ned remembered the way she had smiled then, how tightly her fingers had clutched his as she gave up her hold on life, the rose petals spilling from her palm, dead and black. After that, he remembered nothing. They had found him still holding her body, silent with grief. And elsewhere, he remembers a bed of blood. So we have blood and we have a fever uh, that had taken her strength. Um, the, the, the very clear... It, implication here is that this is uh, some kind of uh, and there's always somebody in the chat who can helpfully give me the medical name for it but sort of a, a post-birth infection um, that thankfully nowadays uh, in a, a lot of the world that that we can deal with with some antibiotics but back then uh, was very often life-threatening so that's the very clear implication as for where um it's the Tower of Joy. And uh, I, I don't think, I mean, yes, we don't have Ned specifically remembering. And then I walked down the Prince's Pass and then took a left up here and found my way to the Tower of Joy. And then after I dealt with the King's Guard, I went into this tower and walked up. The, we don't have that level of detail of exactly what it is. But he remembers the Tower of Joy. And this is connected to his memory of the Tower of Joy. And... Um, that is how he found us. So whatever confrontation happens with the Kingsguard outside happens. He hears her calling, it would appear, from the tower. He goes in. She is dying. And uh, she makes him promise her something. And then she dies, holding onto his hand. And uh, he kind of loses his memories at this point and gets found later by Hound Reed and at least one other person. Um, uh, so a postpartum hemorrhage. Thank you very much, people in the chat. Uh, so yeah, that's the sort of modern medical uh, way of saying it, I believe. Um, let's go with a question from Lady Pushkin saying, why is Barbary Dustin so keen to get into the Winterfell crypts? She notices swords missing. Do you think this changes her mind and loyalty to the Starks for some reason? Okay, so this is quite late on in the story. So the Boltons have got Winterfell. Um, Theon is there um, as weak. And this is just after the, uh, the wedding between... Ramsay and fake Arya. And um, Barbary Dustin, Lady Barbary Dustin, uh, walks into this room, finds uh, the hall, and finds Theon, and says, uh, you know your way around Winterfell, don't you? Which is an interesting starting point, because all of the people there don't. Winterfell had been 
gutted, it had been burned. Everybody who had grown up and lived in Winterfell had been carted off to the bread fort. So everybody who was there now had moved into this massive ancient uh, castle, which was part burnt down, but also part still standing and, and a complicated structure to work your way around. And uh, Theon, nobody really thinks about this, but he is probably the only person there who really knows his way around. And she says, show me where the Winterfell crypts are. My men have been looking for them for days now. We've been going down into the cellars and into the dungeons, and we can't find a way in. We know the Winterfell crypts are here somewhere. Show us. And so he uh, shows them, shows her. Uh, and basically, it's, it's, it's hidden. So the door to the crypts is outside. It's uh, near the Godswood. But there's a big snowdrift up against it, and it takes them half an hour to dig away the snow. Then they have to, the, the door is frozen in place. They have to get that out of the way, um, and then they head down. And when they go down there, uh, she, uh, he says something like, why, why do you hate the Starks? Um, and she says, same reason you do. It's a really interesting little link between the, the two of them. Uh, and so it's, it's like, why why does Theon hate the stocks? And this this like moment of clarity. It's because it's because I wanted to be a Stark. I grew up here amongst these people next to Rob, and yeah, you know, something deep down, that's he wanted to be a Stark, but he wasn't. And she says, then that's, that's the same for me. I wanted to be a Stark too. Um, she was in love with Brandon Stark, Ned's older brother. And then uh, Brandon got told that he wasn't allowed to marry her. He had to go off and uh, marry uh, Catelyn Tully, as she was at the time. And uh, so she wanted to be a Stark but couldn't be a Stark. Uh, and also she has a grudge against Ned Stark, uh, which I've talked about several times, but basically she really hates him uh, and wants to make sure that his bones do not end up in Winterfell because her husband's bones, her husband was one of the men who went with Ned to the Tower of Joy and uh Ned came back from the Tower of Joy with his sister's bones, but not her husband's. And the clear implication is that she then would have said, well, where is he? I'll go and get him then if you can't bring him back to me. And Ned went, I'm not telling you. And so, and then he got on his horse and headed up to Winterfell to give his sister the burial that she wanted in Winterfell crypts. So she's been bearing this grudge, and her her decision is that she is going to stop Ned from being buried there. Um, and quite a long time ago, Ned Stark's bones um, were working their way up through north, through the neck. They never made it past the neck. Um, she, Lady Barbara Dustin, had put people guarding the north, uh, the, the top of the neck, because this is where House Dustin was based. Uh, she had people guarding the top of the neck, keeping an eye out for those when the bones came through, and they hadn't. And so she's there going, well, where are they? And so clearly the implication is that she's going, well, maybe so they somebody somehow managed to sneak past my guys. Maybe they got a little fishing boat or something and, and sort of went up the coast. Who knows? But her, she is going to Winterfell Crips to see whether or not she says, show me Ned Stark's tomb. And they go up and they see Ned Stark's tomb. It's empty. Um, then she has a bit of a moment with Brandon Stark, the man that she loved and his statue. Um, but that's why she was looking in the crypts. Uh, she does notice that some of the swords are gone. And this uh, doesn't seem to immediately... Obviously, it means that somebody's been in there and has taken them. 
but not recently. So she seems very clever. It's possible that she might start figuring out what happened. Somebody was hiding in there. Uh, somebody then set off and needed some swords. That uh, it, Her brain may well go through this, but I don't think this is going to change her loyalties in any particular way. Um, Martin S. What would have happened if Brandon Stark, the Thread Raven, or some green seer before them had gone evil into the Joker's want to watch the world burn mode? Something very bad, I bet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so the the Three Eyed Crow once once um, the Blood Raven has been hooked up into the Weirwood network. The important thing there is he's not moving anymore. He's He's now part of the tree. The tree is growing through him. We get a really graphic description. I mean, there's coming out a bit of root come through his eyeball socket and things like that. Really quite graphic stuff. Um, he's not going anywhere. So his influence now, once he's up there, is through other people. And he does seem to be doing this. Uh, he obviously manages to get Bran and up to him and he manages to um, influence um, Jodren Reed to get him to be coming up to helping Bran. So he is, he's doing things and almost certainly doing even more than we're, but we're aware, but not himself. So yes, he could, but it's through influence rather than the Joker literally going out there and putting uh, bombs in various places. Um, question Donna Daly Do you think we'll hear from Benjamin again? Oh, um, interesting question. Um, possibly. So, um, I did do a video on what happened to Benjamin. Basically, he headed up north, he was trying to find out what was going on. Um, his group got attacked at some point, it got attacked by some whites or the um, the others. Um, the implication is that he survived that uh, because two of his group became whites and headed back to the wall. Those were the two the, the two bodies that the Night's Watchman found north of the wall, brought south of the wall, and then they became whites and started attacking Lord Com Commander Mormont. They were from Benjamin's group. So the implication, because it wasn't that wasn't Benjamin, the implication Benjamin somehow survived that. He had this uh, habit, he left markings to show where he'd been, slashed trees as he was going past them. And they found these heading northwest uh, all the way through the haunted forest until they reached um, the hills, the mountains on the far side, at which point the trail kind of dries up. Now, does, does this mean that he survived? Well, possibly. You have to ask why he's not come back yet. Um, so you've got the the question of he could just be dead that's one option or he could have decided that he has to find out he he can't just return with the oh yeah i came out and uh, the others are there uh, there i found some whites i found a whole load of wildlings everybody we, they knew this already that they, they they got this information basically if maybe he just decided to go on even further forward um one intriguing snippet that George Martin has told us a while ago now about the winds of winter is that we will see further north than we have so far. And you have to ask how, through whose eyes, um, maybe this is Bran with his new superpowers, he can see far north. But maybe, maybe Benjamin will return and maybe he will tell us someone what he found up there so um i i leave it uh i mean i think well 
I was going to say I leave it 50-50. I, I think we will find out what happens to Benjamin Stark. This was set up as such a mystery at the beginning. I think we George Martin is not going to leave it be. And if that's the if we are going to find out, then I think that he uh he will return in some way. I don't think we're just going to find his body somewhere. Uh, reflective rambling, uh, picking up a question from Nick Crum, thank you very much, saying, greetings and best wishes. How does the fact that we have seen a Winterfell with no Stark in it shape our interpretation of this saying? Um, well, it depends uh, on which, what level of... Uh, power you wish to uh, ascribe to this saying. You could just say this was a, a bit of good geopolitical propaganda on the Starks part saying there must always be a Stark in Winterfell which kind of like cements their claim to it. Uh, but then you could try and say is this, uh, is this a magical thing? Must there therefore always be there for some reason? My general take is that what that is coming from is this idea of what what is going on in the crypts is you've got Stark after Stark after Stark, generation after generation after generation, being buried down in the crypts, having statues made of them in the crypts. And there must always be a Stark there because you have to have the next generation put down there. That's my that's my general take on why it is, and it's connected with what we'll get onto a little bit, what I think the ultimate purpose of the Winterfell Crypts is. Um, I think I had another question somewhere. Uh, yep. Here we go. Uh, Joel the Dreamer. My biggest problem with the Starks in the show, as opposed to the books, is that they were a lot wealthier in the books. Um, uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, the... Uh, I mean, I don't know what the, 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 the problem here is in terms of how this impacts on the plot. Uh, I don't think that this, for me at least, I don't think that impacts huge amounts because, um, yes, they they were a wealthy family. Um, but that hasn't impacted on, uh, I think, for me, much of the story. Arya's story doesn't, you know, the fact that she used to be part of a wealthy family hasn't impacted on anything. Similarly, Bran and Rickon, um, I don't think it has affected John in any way, uh, and then you get... Um, uh, Sansa, who obviously was brought up in great privilege, and that has impacted on her. Um, and Rob, I don't think that has changed huge amounts there. So yes, there's there's a there are differences. Uh, I don't for me, I, I can't see that that's a huge has a huge impact. Um, Caius Ballerina, could Ned have had some slight green seer powers? His sense of doom at leaving the north reminds me of Jojen on his way to Bloodraven. It's entirely possible. You have to say that the the Stark kids all having these powers and seems to imply that Ned should have something. Because this hasn't come from Cat. This has come from the Stark line. So uh yeah maybe um i th i think though that um it's not huge and obvious with with ned stark whatever it is um his sense of doom yeah is there uh but i i think you can easily explain that by s saying you know stark's heading south it rarely goes well um so uh, and and this was him returning to the place of uh, of his trauma, or getting closer to the place of his trauma. We have to always remember with Ned Stark that he is a person with post traumatic stress. He he's tried desperately to bury everything. In some cases, quite literally everything to do with what happened at the Tower of Joy. He's tried to get rid of any signs, any 
memories. He shuts people down if they're trying to talk about it. Um, he doesn't even like to think about it. Uh, if he has a dream about it, then he considers that a really bad thing. Uh, so that's that's where he and he's heading back down south uh, to people who may have been part witnesses to some of what was happening. Um, and this that's it's he's been in a happy, safe place in the north for 15 years. Then suddenly he's got to go back into the, the viper's nest. Um, Joel the Dreamer saying John was an entitled brat when he first got to the wall. Yeah, that I mean that absolutely is very true. Um, he, um, I mean, his first couple of chapters, he doesn't come across very well. It has to be said. He he does he matures quite a lot uh, when you get to uh, Storm of Swords, for example. If you compare what he's like. Uh, when he first arrives at the wall to what he's like at Storm of Swords in terms of the training yard, the change is massive. When he first arrives from Winterfell, he is uh, he's basically beating people up because they're not very good at fighting and he's been trained how to fight and they haven't. When you get to uh, him a couple of books later, he's actively going out there trying to train other people. So he, he grows a huge amount. Um, let's go to um, a question from Martin S. Hello, Robert. I had one question about Catelyn Talia Stark and her choice to trust Littlefinger in the first season of the show and I guess the first book. Um, my assessment is, of course, that it was completely disastrous for the Starks, such that it would not have made much difference had she trusted Tywin Lannister himself. Um, the end result for the Stark family would not have been any worse. What do you think? Um, I suppose she had some history with him to make her trust him. Still, as a judge of character, Catelyn was unimpressive, uh, disliking and distrusting the wrong people. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd find it hard to disagree on that last point. Um, but in terms of her trusting him, uh, I don't know that she ever completely trusts him. Uh, certainly in the books, uh, but she, that doesn't mean that she doesn't believe him. Now, you have to remember, she's heading down to King's Landing. She she doesn't know anyone there. She's very wary of what's going on there, and she is pretty convinced that the Lannisters are behind all the bad things happening to her house, so she can't trust the Lannisters. Um but then she comes across um, Littlefinger. Well, he finds her, let's put it that way. And in terms of their history, from her perspective, uh, yet we often sort of look back on this go, oh, yeah, he, was, he wasn't that great. Uh, in fact, he was really quite seedy in his younger days. But he was fostered with her and her sister. And he developed this massive crush on her. And she clearly was aware of this. Um, and Lysa, and I think we can probably believe to an extent this, it basically says that Catelyn just kind of used, she knew this and she kind of played on it a little bit. Um, Lysa talks about her leading him on and things like that. But basically, uh, they they played together as children. They grew up together. He developed a huge crush on her and um, wanted to marry her. When Brandon Stark appeared and the uh, engagement was announced, he challenges Brandon to a duel, which is just like this huge mismatch. Um, and uh, he gets beaten hugely, and she has to beg Brandon to stop um, now, he then basically gets chased out of River Run and heads back home, uh, at which point, or after which point, events move very quickly. Brandon Stark dies. Cat uh, finds herself being married to Ned Stark. She does get a letter from Littlefinger at one point and decides not to open it. That was now all in her past. What happens uh, happened then? Um, and she's not seen him for 15 years. 
Uh, but she's probably heard. She's grown up. She's married, had lots of children. Um, she's probably heard that he's now, um, he, he's done well for himself. He, he was the portmaster in Gulltown, became very rich, used that as a, um, a, a chance to go to King's Landing, became master of coin. He's done very well for himself. So she probably thinks out of everybody in King's Landing, I at least know him. I at least know who he is. Um, and as far as she's aware, he's not got a particular reason to be against her because they last, he was, you know, he was in love with her. Added to which, and I think this is probably the most important point, Littlefinger, um, how he stirs the pot and what she believes is him basically saying that the cat's poor dagger, this came from Tyrion. And Tyrion's the person who tried to kill Bran. And Cat wanted to hear that. And so she's willing to believe it very easily. And I think that's the key point here. This is confirmation bias going on with Cat at this point. She wants to find evidence that um, uh, the Lannisters were behind this, and she gets given evidence, bad evidence, but she gets given evidence, and so she happily believes it. Okay, um, let's go to um, Mara Lee. Uh, I'm curious about how Stark's words, winter is coming and the North remembers. Uh, Besides stating the obvious about the winter, do you think this is anything to do with the first long night, the pact, the others, and the children of the forest? Well, yeah, quite possibly, uh, some of that anyway. Um, winter is coming is a warning, and a warning for people to be ready. And winter is the long night. So almost certainly this is connected in with that. The North remembers. Um, everybody else will forget about what happens uh, and the North remembers one can assume is again about the long night. Uh, ironically, of course, the North does seem, or most of the North seems to have forgotten. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the, the clear implication is to start with, that's where, where they came from, but they probably taken on new meanings over time. Willie Biggs 2000, will John ride a dragon in the winds or after? How do you think that could play out? Um, well, I don't, probably not in the winds of winter, because uh, probably in the winds of winter, the dragons are still going to be in Essos until the very, very end. Um, uh, the... The working assumption I've always had, simply for story reasons as much as anything else, is that, uh, yes, he will be one of the dragon riders. This will partly prove his ancestry, uh, and he will probably ride Regal, uh, the dragon that was named after his father. Pardon me. So, um, how might that happen? Well, um, <laughs> It, it's it, this feels like one of those things that George R. Martin would probably have to write a few times. Um, he may well head down. We think that they're going to meet him and Daenerys are going to meet, um, because of a number of reasons, but <coughs> pardon me, uh, but uh, at least partly because of her dreams and visions in the House of the Undying. Um, now. To, in order to get access to all of the dragon glass that they know that they need, um, what happened obviously on the TV show was that John went down to Dragonstone. Now, whether he would personally go and do that in the books, I, I don't know, but it would be a convenient way for the two of them to meet and for him to meet a dragon, as it were. And if he finds it easy to connect with a dragon, then, and then if he and Daenerys start falling in love in some way, 
uh, you could certainly see the potential that maybe uh, maybe he might start, I don't know, petting a dragon or something like that, and then it sort of goes on from there. So that's the first option, is it's uh, without him knowing it that he's got any Targaryen blood, he just like gets close to dragons, and it seems okay. Uh, but then the other option is that he finds his ancestry or discovered, is told of his ancestry, and uh, then... Uh, in order, he knows that in order to defeat the others, the biggest and best weapon would be a dragon rider, and he takes that upon himself to see whether he can do that, as he has got Targaryen blood. So I think that's those are the two obvious-ish ways that that could happen. Um, Right, let's go to a question from uh, Commander Ray. Oh, yeah, Commander Ray, you, you gave a lot of questions about Lyanna Stark, so let's uh, let's go through these. Um, Lyanna Stark was a fantastic horse rider and was able to beat down several squires and even defeated knights in a joust, or so we believe, showing strong prowess and a deal of training. How were Stark women raised traditionally? Was the way Lyanna possibly received formal training and Arya... Um, later having her own dancing master common for the Starks in particular, or was it a rare thing? I know Ned said Rickard didn't allow it, but she didn't seem to get the mem memo. And when Ned got Syria to teach Arya, was that a hint to the Starks being more open to it or a way to honour his sister? Well, it's a bit of both. I think that Ned hiring Syria was um, partly him indulging his daughter, because he took her down to King's Landing and she wasn't really enjoying it. Uh, it wasn't her thing. And, well, let her do her thing. Let her actually have a hobby. Part of it's that. Part of it, I think, is that Ned's sense of foreboding meant that he thought, she's got a sword, she might as well learn how to use it. And uh, it might, it, we might need it at some point down here in Kingsland. We might need it. So I, I think those kind of practical ish reasons are there. As for uh, training and Liana, now we do get this vision through Bran through the Weirwood tree of what it would appear as Liana and Benjen in the Godswood play fighting with swords now what that might mean because benjen would have been trained with a sword and if she wasn't being trained though the two of them were close so maybe he passed on what he knew to her so maybe that's the way that worked as for horse riding yeah that seems definitely it's, it's a northern thing it's completely allowed um uh, you get uh Aya at one point gets told that she rides like a northerner. Um, like Liana, she was half centaur, uh, that one. Um, so, yes, learning how to ride was definitely a skill that female stocks were allowed. The fighting, not so much. Um, and we've looked at various northern houses, and we, this does seem to shift a little by house. Um, so uh, House Mormont the women there historically on Bear Island were taught to fight because the men were going away in their fishing boats. And what happens if the ironborn arrive while they're out, the women have to fight. But that wasn't necessarily the case for the Starks. Um, then second on that, you say, can I go over the events of the tourney at Harrenhal from the Stark perspective? and give a plausible series of events with Lyanna and the Knight of the Laughing Tree, and how her interactions with Rhaegar discovering her identity went down, uh, what might have been said. Well, so a, a plausible set of events here. If we take a step back, there was winter, and then spring came, and the invites went out to this massive tawny. And Rickard, Lord Rickard Stark was wanting um, to uh, expand, have his Southron ambitions. So 
he's got Ned already fostered down in the Erie. Uh, he's got Brandon engaged to be married to the into the Tully family. Um, the the clear implication is that Liana was going to go down and stay down there for a bit, perhaps to be fostered or to be or to stay with a noble family for a little while. Because after I'll come back to actually the uh, turning at Harren Hall in just one moment. After the turning at Harren Hall, she noticeably did not return north. Benjamin went back north. After the turning at Harren Hall, the Starks spread out. You must always have a Stark in Winterfell, remember. And Rickard Stark, Daddy Stark, stayed up there while the tourney was going on. He sent his four kids down there. He stayed up. Benjamin went up to Winterfell became the Stark in Winterfell, allowing Rickard to head south. The idea was that when Rickard got south, that's when they, they would do the, the wedding, the Brandon um, uh, wedding to uh, Catelyn Stark, Catelyn Tully, as she was then. Uh, so that's what happened there. Ned headed off back to the Eyrie with Robert Baratheon, and Brandon went off to Riverrun to hang out with the the soon-to-be in-laws. Um, Lyanna, we're not told, but the implication is that she hung around somewhere in the south. She certainly didn't go to the Eyrie with Ned. She certainly didn't go north with Benjen. And we don't get any implication that she went um, with Brandon uh, over to Riverrun. So perhaps she stayed local. Perhaps she stayed with House Went. The, that's the clear implication. So this was the plan. I also think that there was probably a plan. It was time for Ned to start thinking about who, who should we, or time for the, the Starks to start thinking about who should we be marrying Ned to. And this, the, the tourney is not just about uh, the jousting. This is also about matchmaking. After two years of, of winter when nobody could really travel around much, suddenly we get this opportunity. So um, Brandon Stark seems to be head of the house there. They arrive down. Um, the Starks don't really do much by way of the jousting and taking part in tourneys, but they're there. They set up camp They're They're there. And there's a whole load of politics going on in the background, um, uh, which they will have been involved in in some uh, ways. But if we fast forward to um, Liana, who stumbles across a situation where one young lad is being attacked by three squires, and she quickly realizes that this young lad actually is a member of House Reed, one of House Stark's bannerman. So she chases them off, the, the squires who are beating up this guy. She clearly, this is, this is, she's clearly got a strong sense of justice here. Um, he, this, this is one of the Stark bannermen. He should be protected. And she, having done this, she then brings him. He, it becomes clear he's he's not got an invite. He just happens to be here. So she says, right, come along. You'll stay with us. Uh, with the Starks, you, while we're here, then you can be with us. Um, and Ned says, you can share my tent with me. And then we get this big feast where everybody's there at the massive hall in Harren Hall. And Leanna's there going, well, what are you going to do? Howland, what are you going to do about these uh, squires who attack you? Your your honour has to be avenged. And Howland's like, no, I'm not, I don't know, no, it's not really my thing. I'm not that good at that kind of stuff. Um, Benjamin pipes up and he says, I can get I can get some armour from somewhere if, if that's what you need. And Howland's like, no, I'm not really like that. Um, we're just following this line of what we think is the most likely here your, your personal interpretation may differ slightly but at this point with howland having basically saying no i'm not going to be doing this uh liana is clearly the one who thinks that some sort of justice has to be served 
Benjen, who we know that she's close to, has already said that he knows how to get rid of how how to get hold of some armor for the jousting. Um, she then decides, well, if he's not going to do it, I'll do it. We know that she's a very good um, horsewoman, uh, and we know that she's you know at, at least done some practicing with with swords. So uh, she probably thinks I can give this a go. Entering attorney as a mystery knight is a well-established tradition. Uh, she enters, she manages to defeat those three, the knights uh, for whom those three squires worked, manages, she's not after their money, she doesn't need the Starks, as we've already noted, the Starks are rich, they don't need the money, but she's actually not there for any of that, she's just there to be making a point about honour and making those uh, you know, have to teach these uh, these squires about honour. So having done that, she can then uh, abandon it. She doesn't have to do any more. That's where the, how to, uh, the, the Knight of the Laughing uh, Tree goes. Disappears because the, the thing that Leanna wanted done has happened. However, uh, the Mad King obsessed by who this mystery knight is and sends Rhaegar to track down the mystery knight which Rhaegar does and if you followed this you know we we can see the the armor there we know that armors they different armorers have got different styles um uh, you it, it should be possible for a clever person to be able to track down where bits of armor where a horse comes from um and he probably would be able to track it down to liana um now when he does that he's not going to give her up to the mad king uh, and also, he's probably going to be quite surprised that this knight of the laughing tree, this mystery knight, is a woman. And at the back of his mind, to go into Rhaegar's mind for a moment, he's he's now looking for somebody. We, we pretty much clearly established this by this point. I'm not going to go all the way down the Rhaegar uh, rabbit hole uh, right now. But uh, he is looking for somebody who can be a mother to a third child for him, who he wants to name Visenya after the fierce warrior, uh, Queen Visenya. Um, so he suddenly stumbles across this amazing warrior woman in uh, who defeated three knights, and he confronts her they talk for a long time perhaps and this is the bit where we don't know how have any information perhaps this is where they fall in love and this is where and why at the end of it he awards the um the laurels to her because he knows nobody else knows but he knows that actually she went undefeated in this tourney he may have won it which is why he's got. He can crown the queen of love and beauty. Uh, he can pass on these this uh, uh, the winter roses. But there's more than a hint that perhaps he won it in a slightly underhand way, and so he wishes to give the laurels to the person who was undefeated in a completely above the board way. So uh, that's the. Um, the sort of the logic from the Stark perspective. If Lyanna Stark does stay in Harrenhal after the whole, after everyone's disappeared, which seems reasonably likely given where we know she was a little bit later, um, that was owned by House Went. And House Went were Rhaegar loyalists. So if they wished to carry on their correspondence, that would be entirely possible um, uh, after the Tony had finished. So it wouldn't just be a matter of, I met you there, and then months later I came back and found you. Um, 
and then you also asked Commander Ray, with how tall, uh, given how tall Liana's ghost is in the first book, do you think it's the trauma and lost promise of her early death that haunts the living, like Ned and Robert, or do you think she was the charismatic character and natural leader that her son Joy John is? Well, she certainly seems charismatic. Um, uh, everybody seems to remember her, and um, even people like Bruce Bolton sort of seem to have taken notice of her. Um, she was a much for Ned, she was a much loved sister, and for Robert, this was the woman who I mean, maybe love is too much of a word for it, but he definitely was infatuated with her. Um, so the for Ned, the trauma that he has is not just about her, though. Uh, the trauma that he has is about the fact that this whole war tens of thousands of people dying happened because of what happened there. It wasn't her fault, not in the slightest bit. She didn't do anything wrong. But because of what happened there, that caused the, the knock-on effect of that was a war which cost, you know, and, and not, not just random people he didn't know as well, but huge amounts of people that he knew and cared about from the north, who then suddenly these were people he was the lord of uh, the of Winterfell, and these were people who he was ordering to war uh, for reasons that it turns out, um, although good reason against the the Mad King who was going around killing lots of people in rather horrific ways, but for her. Uh, she was the, the the spark that started all of this, and that is what wrapped up in all of his trauma. Okay, let's uh, go to uh, the chat. Um, I think I had a question here somewhere. Um, uh, Aaron Guinness saying, no question. Just wanted to say I appreciate all you do and for covering House Stark on my birthday. Well, happy birthday to you. I hope you have a, a fantastic day. That's your first super chat as well. So thank you. I hugely appreciate that. Um, Carlos Ballerina, why does John feel unwelcome in the crypts? He's half Stark. If he settles the new gift like Ned wanted, um, where would Bran and Rickon be lords? Um uh, right, so why does he feel unwelcome in the crypts if he's half Stark? Um, one can only assume that there are rules here in that he, if he, if his parents had married, which is possible, we don't know, then he would be a Targaryen. Um, by inheritance laws and things like that. Um, yes, he is half Stark, but there would be no burial place for him in the Winterfell crypts. Um, now, the interesting nuance here is that uh, he clearly has the connection to it because he feels them talking to him. So there's like two levels of this, is that it's... Um, uh, or oh, actually, there's another level I'll mention in just one moment. There, but there's uh, he's there is no place for him, and yet unlike other people who just sort of will go down there and feel like oh, I don't really like this, that the statues aren't talking to them. And the third level is just um, uh, there. There is no place for you here. This is not your place. What is John Stark's story? Uh, his story is that he is going to be in everyone's eyes killed and come back and what are the people from beyond the grave saying to him there's no place for you here so that's the the next kind of level is that he is he is not supposed to be there that is not the where he's going he's supposed to be he has got a completely different role to be playing in this um and if he settled in the new gift like uh, like Ned wanted, where would Bran and Rickon have been lords? Um, I don't know that. We don't know. I don't think we've got enough information on um, uh, that. Uh, the thing is that they're still very young. I mean, Rickon was three 
um, at the start of this story. So they're still very young. So any idea of who they might marry uh, and where they might settle down, I think, was still a long way off. Uh, Martin S. Rob Stark proved himself as a very capable military commander early in the war. Was Eddard a master strategist or was Rob trained by someone? Um, so as a very capable military commander, um, well, yes, but I think the biggest thing was he allowed himself to have help and he took advice. So we do get to see some times when he's coming up with his original plan. It's a good original plan. But Cat, his mother, sort of like does quiz him a little bit, push him on a few things. And he does, as a result of that, he changes. He, originally, he was thinking having Great John Umber be the person leading the force down the King's Road towards um, uh Tywin Lannister. If that had happened, almost certainly Tywin would have beaten beaten Great John Umber because his entire strategy was based on somebody who was just uh, brave and young and not thinking much about strategy, which is what the Great John John would be. He wouldn't be young, but he he was all about just sort of charging into battle and not too much about the tactics. The reason why that, um, although it was a victory for Tywin over Rhys Bolton, uh, it was not a not a decisive one, is because Rhys Bolton was a lot more reserved and a lot more calm and calculating. So Rob's original high-level strategy there was a good one, but it did need a tweak. And if it hadn't had the tweak and the suggestion from Kat, then probably it would have gone very differently. Similarly, he allowed um, the Blackfish, who knew obviously the area of the Riverlands, to take a really strong role in uh, the getting the army into the right place and stopping any information getting back to Jamie Lannister that, hey, there's an army on the way. Uh, so uh, there's um, him taking advice um, was Ned uh, a capable master strategist? Uh, was Rob trained by someone else? Well, there's no real evidence of what Ned was like as a personal strategist in war. Um, he doesn't, well, as far as we know, he was he never really took personal lead in any of these battles. In Robert's Rebellion, uh, he came down, there was the Battle of the Bells, uh, but that was just a charging into a um, a town, as far as we can tell. Um, and then by the time they got to the Battle of the Trident, then he wasn't really um, uh, in charge. This was then Robert Baratheon's battle. Uh, there was the, the Siege of Storm's End, but that wasn't a battle at all. Ned doesn't really get the chance to show he's a good battle commander. Um, Rob appears competent, but doesn't really show um, sort of genius level in, in any of this. Uh, it's it's just it's competent and it, thinking slightly outside the box. Um, how do I get into the Westlands? Oh well, um, my direwolf has found us a nice little goat track we can go through. Um, it's that kind of level that was there rather than this, uh, well, I've got some great strategic cunning plan. Um, he does do well, uh, but yeah, I don't think it's because he's been trained to do well. Um, let's have a quick flick through. Aaron McGuinness done that one already. And... Um, Kelly Summers, in Rickard's Southron ambitions, going to and hosting tourneys made sense. Was Stark influence enough to draw lords to a major tourney at Winterfell? Um, well, the North didn't really do tourneys. Um, so he, he could have done, he could have had a tourney at Winterfell and people would have turned up. I have absolutely no, no doubt about that. Um, but that's not really uh, it. You you have to be at a tourney, but you do not have to host the tourney. Um, his Southron ambitions, as far as we can figure them out, 
basically what he needed to achieve was some um, strong alliances with the more southerly major houses and he was achieving that already with Ned forming a close strong friendship with John Aaron and Robert Baratheon uh, with Brandon about to marry the Tullys um, he was he was achieving this uh, so he didn't really need to set up a a tourney itself uh, maybe a better way if he if he had wanted to go down that route maybe a better way could have been to um have a tourney somewhere like white harbor that was sponsored by the stocks um but it would be easier for people to get to uh let's go to um Uh, Mara Lee, can you elaborate on the importance of the Pact of Ice and Fire and how it will play out in the Dance of the Dragons? Do you think we will see the Pact of Ice and Fire being made during Season 2 of House of the Dragon? Do you think uh, that we will, on the show, hear more about the prophecy importance of the North's role? Um, okay, so will we see it on the show? Yes, absolutely. Deserus has headed north. Um, in the trailer, we saw some northerners that I, I think staring at them a little bit more i think they might even be night's watch um but yes he will go to winterfell he will agree the pact of ice and fire um this will have an impact because it will mean that the north join uh the battle join the war and um the bit that i'm I'm not sure, but I think they won't be able to resist, is this bit about prophecies and the importance of the North's role. Because having started this idea that the Targaryens are there to be, um, they've actually got a higher purpose. They're not just conquering, they're here because there's this threat from the North. They have to be ruling the Seven Kingdoms and um, uh, that is passed down from uh, monarch to monarch once you've established that then if you are going to go to the north and this is the only time probably we will go to the north in the entire show then surely you would make some link across to the others in some way now how they do that i do not know um but we didn't see Jaceris told about this maybe he was off camera Maybe Rhaenyra um, informed him because he's her heir. She informed him of uh, this uh, uh, prophecy, this uh, this dream, Aegon's dream, um, in the same way that Viserys had to her. Maybe that happened off camera and we didn't see it, in which case perhaps this will be used as a, a way for the Jaceris and Cregan to be sort of bonding in some way. So... I don't know. I would personally be quite happy if we don't have too much uh, focus on like the others actually being there um, in any way. Uh, I think that kind of diminishes when they do return properly. But uh, maybe a little bit of talk of prophecy would work quite well. Uh, Jay saying, hi, Robert. Hi there. Uh, do you think the Tyrells had a specific plan for the future of the north of Westeros? Um, had Sansa married Loras? And she was the last Stark with a claim to Winterfell. Or was it simply uh, a power grab? Um, so in the books, this was, um, although she had a major crush on Loras, this was Willis. This was the plan. Um, uh, who was the heir, actually, to... Um, High Garden. Now, uh, the the cunning plan from the Tyrells was that uh, they once her engagement to uh, Joffrey had be, been got rid of, uh, she would go and head over there and get married to into the Tyrells. Now, this plan didn't ever happen because uh, Sansa 
blurted it out to Sedontos. Sedontos told Littlefinger. Littlefinger told um, uh, Tywin. And Tywin said, we cannot allow that to happen. Uh, I want her to be marrying a Lannister. I've got a spare Lannister. He's called Tyrion, so we'll marry the two of them. My feeling is that the Tyrell plan to marry Sansa to them was exactly the same as Tywin's plan to marry Sansa to um, Tyrion. It's an attempt to grab Winterfell. Now, the, the, the geostrategic point here is that with Rob Stark gone, um, which, and although there was kind of, this is still the build-up to this at, at many points here, um, this is definitely something that Tywin is planning for. With him gone, you have to say, well, who's who's next? This is the Rob Stark's will issue. The, the video coming out tomorrow is that everybody's going through this thought process. Well, okay, if Rob dies, well, who takes over? Well, it'll be Bran and then Rickon. But, oh, yeah, didn't Theon kill them? Everybody thinks that Theon killed them. So who's next after that? Sansa's next. So um, if we marry... If Tyrion marries Sansa, then Sansa is the heir to Winterfell. When they have children, um, they will then take over Winterfell. So the Lannisters would control not just their own land and the, the, the crown lands, but also the north. This is almost certainly the same plan that the Tyrells had. If we marry Sansa, then we can control the North because the Starks are incredibly weak. So I think it's just a power grab, and I don't think there's, uh, I don't think there needs to be anything subtler than that. Um, question from Michelle Rimo saying, um, "We know that the First Men and the Children of the Forest entered into the Pact." to stop the violence and to live in peace together. I always wondered who the First Men leader was during that time, with my own personal theory being that it must have been a Stark King of Winter. Do you think it was one of the many Brandon Starks who helped to facilitate the pact and encourage peace between the First Men and the Children of the Forest? Would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so um, let me go through the very high level timeline that we have, because... Um, we should first of all say, before I get into the, the timings that we have, uh, George R. Martin repeats again and again and again, this is all in the Age of Legend. Uh, the exact order of things, who knows, that might not have happened like that. The exact stories we hear, probably exaggerated. So um, that is the background. But the... The iteration of events that we've been told is humans come in, uh, they have this long fight against the children of the forest. Eventually, the leaders of both sides decide to uh, have a peace deal. It's called the Pact. Um, this creates peace for a period of time. After that uh, period of time, then we get to the Long Night, once the long night has been finished, then we get the establishment of the wall and Winterfell and the creation of House Stark. So, on that timeline that we've been given, House Stark does not exist at the time of the creation of the Pact. Now, as I said earlier, that doesn't mean that there can't have been a, a predecessor of the Starks who was there at that time. Uh, but... It, it, it doesn't matter. The, the clear implication is that it wasn't just a leader. It was the leaders gathered at that point. And um, I quite like the idea that perhaps the Starks got involved or became so closely involved in the defense of the North because they had some connection in with what happened in the Long Night, not necessarily what happened with the Pact. Commander Ray, I've heard you mention before how Jon's rages are tied to his dragon blood, but I would argue that it is tied to his wolf blood. 
Ned even brings up wolf blood. His uncle Brandon was a hot-tempered man like John, and even Leanna was a fierce and fiery person. What are your thoughts on this and how John's temper will impact his story? And the murder of Danny, perhaps, um, and if he'll be worse when he goes back. Okay, so his temper is... Um, it's very noticeable in the books. You, you said a bit on the show, but basically he goes into berserk mode a few times in the books. Uh, he, Alistair Thorne basically hurls abuse at his father, or who he to Ned, um, and John just goes at him. He's not feeling, he's not in a good place uh, mentally at the time, but he just goes for him with a dagger. And we're told, I think it's five people have to be there to pull him away. That's one time. Another time, just before, bizarrely, just before he's uh, made Lord Commander, he's also in not a particularly good place because he's headed up north, done everything that happened beyond the wall. He's had to kill Corrin half-hand. He's had to spend all his time incognito pretending to be uh, a wildling or to have abandoned his Night's Watch oath. He's come back. He's he's achieved his mission. He's somehow survived. The, the, the woman he loved has just died and it's partly his fault. Uh, he certainly betrayed her. Um, and then after all of this, he plays an important role in uh, leading uh, the defense uh, of the wall against the uh, the wildlings. But Alistair Thorne comes back, as does General Slint, and they basically strip him of command and uh, uh, just say, you are a traitor to your vows. He is in a dark place, and um, he's fighting with somebody in the yard, and basically uh, he just loses it again. <laughs> and he has to be hauled, he, he blacks out, and he has to be hauled off by uh, uh, by some of the other people in the yard. This, it's, it's an anger management problem, but it's also it's it's more it's more berserker mode. This thing that this sort of the red just descends, and he has to go um, uh, just all out attack. So uh, m might that be um, wolf blood as well as Targaryen blood? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I wouldn't say that these things are mutually exclusive. He can have a little bit of Targaryen fire to him. He can also have a little bit of uh, Starkish wolf blood to him. Both of those are there. The interesting thing, the point that you're picking up there, which I think is the interesting thing, is how will this impact the story going forward? Because thus far, yes, it's been annoying and inconvenient, but it hasn't it hasn't shifted huge amounts. It's not changed huge amounts um, in the story. So what uh, what impact might this have on the TV show? They did show this, um, in as much as he does what just looked on the TV show as just like a stupid thing because they'd not really built up this kind of uh, John has this kind of berserker mode thing that suddenly comes over him. If you remember at the beginning of the Battle of the Bastards, when you get Rick on, yeah. He gets released, and then Ramsey's doing the you have zigzag Rick on. No, he doesn't. He just run. Anyway, you know that scene. Um, what does Jon Snow do? He just charges ahead into on his own towards the enemy army, which is a ridiculous thing to do. He but he charges straight towards the enemy, and then you have to get people like Davos because they're looking around. Oh, what do we do now? Uh, we did have a plan, but what we do? I'll just charge. Um, and that, in many ways, was the cause of them about to lose, uh, because they would have lost that battle. Again, we're just talking TV show here at the moment, but they would have lost that battle, but for Littlefinger and the, the Knights from the Vale. So um, that's what they did on the show. That tells me that there probably is, whether it's or how similar it is to that. But there's probably something along those lines which happens to John in the books that is a a, a more um, it's more impactful than the things that we've seen already. Um, you were wondering whether this might be something to do with him killing Danny. My my 
instinct is that he goes into these rages <coughs> when it's something to do with his family or his personal honor or something along those lines. It's something that touches him deep inside. So um, it, in any scenario, you have to ask, is this a thing which could push him over the edge? In, in normal day-to-day -day life, he doesn't. It's, this is quite a rare thing. Um, Catherine Furseth saying, um, uh, no Stark stream without addressing the big issue of how they will be a part of the next long night playing out. I speculated some time back that, as Old Nan said, the wall will stand as long as the men of the Night's Watch stay true, and that their weakening and lack of keeping their vows leads to the wall weakening and falling, letting the others through. The North remembers, they say, but even House Stark seems to have forgotten the magical formula of how to defeat the others. Have the Starks stayed true, do you think? Do they remember? The Targaryens had the prophecy handed down from king to heir. Can the Starks at some point have had a similar arrangement? If so, when was this lo knowledge lost? How can they otherwise let something so important fade out of memory? Okay, a lot of really good questions. The last bit, if they had, let's take the, as a, a working assumption, they had the same kind of idea that this, uh, you know, the, the ultimate truth has to be passed down uh, only from monarch to monarch, lord to lord, whatever it is. Um, I mean, I think we have to say, first of all, that's not the most effective way of passing this information down. Um, and it, whereas you could perhaps make an argument for the Targaryens doing that so that nobody knows, you know, nobody thinks, oh, these are just some religious zealots on, the, on a quest for God kind of thing. Uh, with the Starks, it, everybody in the North should know and be prepared. That's the whole point of their main motto. Winter is coming is a way telling people to prepare for it. But leaving all that aside, is there a time when uh, the transmission of that from one generation to the next could happen? Absolutely. And we've talked about it already. Uh, there's a period before Rick or, or between Craig and Stark, who is the the Stark around at the time of the, uh, the Dance of the Dragons, and Rickard Stark, who is Ned Stark's father, between them, loads of Starks die for a variety of reasons. It gets very messy. Uh, Craig and Stark does live for quite a long time. Uh, we hear that he, um, I mean, he's certainly still around during the reign of Diran the First. Um, uh, so uh, he, he must live at least up until um, Baelor the Blessed. Uh, but uh, after that, yes, lots of Starks die. And if lots of Starks die, then if there was some message they were passing down father to son, that could also have been lost. Um, but have they done what they want? Well, if part of this is the Starks have to remain in Winterfell in order to keep the Winterfell crypts well stocked, uh, which is one of my working hypotheses, then they have done it. They have succeeded in doing what they needed to do. The question, the, the thing is that the details of around this, they have lost. How do you defeat the others? Well, okay, we need to think about fire. We need to think about dragon glass. We need to think about the horn of winter. These kind of issues here, Blood Raven has remembered for them. Um, and so Blood Raven uh, has found stuff. You'll remember, for example, um, that uh, cloak of a bundle with dragon glass and that horn uh, that uh, Ghost found and showed John. Um, that, that was almost certainly from Blood Raven. Blood Raven um, got that planted there for for them to take back so that they could learn what these things do um but your your main point i've always really liked this um this idea that the wall will stand as long as the men of the night's watch stay true um but, and their weakening uh, will lead to the wall weakening or falling. I, I really like that. Um, 
I'm not sure the language usage from what an old Nan says 100% backs that up, having gone back to it, um, because she says as long as the wall uh, stands or stays strong and the Night's Watch stay true. So those seem to be two separate. The, the, the linkage between those two, or the line of causality, isn't uh, 100% strong. Um but that said, I, I do like this as an idea, and we need, and this is this is a big thing for the, the plot here, um, and chat, I will read out a few of these things. How do you think the wall will be breached in the books? And this is important because on the show, obviously, they had the dragon, uh, which sort of melted it. Uh, we have confirmation from the showrunners that they made that up. Uh, and this is one of those kind of reverse things when we we always caution just because something happened in the show doesn't mean it's going to happen in the books. Sometimes something happens in the show that we're told does not happen in the books, which leaves a big gap. And here they specifically say, they being the showrunners, specifically said we had to think of a way for the wall to come down. Now you have to, if you take your logic and sort of uh, induce backwards from that, you have to go, okay, so why why is it that um, you have to think of a way? Because George R. R. Martin will have told them. He will have told them what the, the plan was. Um, why do you need to do that? And the, the only possible things are... Uh, because he told them and they thought it wasn't cool looking enough, or because it involved something that they'd not introduced as a topic, as a possibility, uh, and they thought it would be too late to be introducing here at this point. Or the wall doesn't and there's some other clever thing that, that happens. So, uh, chat, I'd love to know your thoughts on, on what it is how is it that the um, uh, uh, the wall is breached in some way? Um, could it be this um, Night's Watch vows being broken or weakening or falling? Because, yes, this is definitely happening. We First of all, we have fewer members of the Night's Watch than ever before. Um, they have abandoned almost all of the uh, the castles along the wall. Uh, there, there was a mutiny, a whole full scale mutiny against the uh, the Lord Commander um, at Craster's Keep. Um, quite a few abandoned the Night's Watch, and then, and let's not forget this: John himself abandoned his Night's Watch vows as Lord Commander, when he got the pink letter and he said, right, that's it, I'm heading off to Winterfell, um, who's with me? That's what prompted the um, uh, the assassination attempt against him, basically. It was him giving up on his vows as a member of the Night's Watch. So, um, yes, this is happening. There is still a hardcore who are sticking to that, and so I think we would have to ask do they all need to die first or be sent somewhere so that there are no members of the watch left? It's possible. Um, uh, let's just have a quick uh, flick through the chat on this. Um, Carl Karsnark saying, I do think they'll get a dragon somehow, which will help melt a hole of sorts. Um, Commander Ray saying the Black Gate requires a Night's Watch member to use, so maybe they get a Black Brother to open the way. Um, yeah, that's possible. Um, Zach K, is it possible the pact was somehow broken, or whatever breaks the wall's magic has a correlation to them returning? Um, it's possible, yes. Um, Andrew K saying the magic being broken is key, as it was the original true barrier. Game of Thrones seem to focus on the physical aspect. This is really important. So the um, the wall we think of 
it being a wall. As far as we can tell, it started as a normal height wall. Um, it just got built bigger and bigger and bigger over time. The real thing are the magical defences that stop dead things from crossing. Um, so how how is that going to be undone? Um, it's a mystery unless it has a magical undoing this is which is why many people say the horn of winter might well do this um brandlin price saying i think the horn wakes the uh, kings of winter for the defense of winterfell i would agree with you on that one um uh erin sunek saying i'm going with the wall falls due to something that wasn't introduced in the show yep i think i would agree um Greet Weirwood, the magic is broken, as shown by the whites on the wrong side that attack Jaor. They just have to come uh, through the gates then. But there, there is still magic. This is the, the this is the thing we don't know, because we don't know exactly how magic works, George R. Martin, in this world. George R. Martin doesn't want us to know exactly how magic works. Yes, so some whites were carried through. The clear implication is, I well, the implication at the time was that they only managed to do to, to get across was because they were taken through by other people. They could not, of their own volition, go through. Um, uh, but is is it possible that that's uh, that has broken the magic? It's not broken all of the magic of the wall because we know that John couldn't sense um, ghost when they were on opposite sides of the wall. We know that Melisandre says that her powers are even more powerful because she is at the wall. Um, and um, we know that Coldhand says that he can't pass through the wall um, when he is down there with Sam and co. So it's it seems to still be working at, at this moment in time. Something will have to happen. Um, Andrew Roberts, how many Starks are there in the crypts? Um, which is a great question. Uh, so we can do a little bit of maths here. Um, the headline is we do not know, but we can get a kind of a scale of these kind of things. So how Stark started at the same time as uh, the Night's Watch. Uh, the Night's Watch have had in that time, give or take, a thousand Lord Commanders. Now, uh, they probably have a shorter shelf life than Lords of Winterfell, but if we say a Lord of Winterfell has, um, on average, reigns for, or a King of Winter on average reigns for 20 years, a generation, and some will be more, some will be less. That means every hundred years we'll have five, every thousand years we'll have 50. Um, so we're told that this that was 8,000 years ago. So eight times 50 is 400 kings of winter, which sounds a feasible amount, but it's not just them who are buried down there. Obviously, there are all the other Starks, how many there does seem to be, you know, it seems to be certainly the children of a Stark lord or king. Um, so I don't know, you add you add on another two or three times that, I guess. What we're talking about is the high hundreds or low thousands. Um, that's the scale of it. I don't think we're ever going to get an exact number, but we're, we're talking about a sizable uh, number of, of dead Starks down there. Um, and then Andrew Roberts saying, will the dead in the crypts join the fight on the living side in the second long night, or will they join the White Walkers? So my take, which I sort of hinted at a while, uh, a few times during this stream, I did a whole video on this, if you want all of the logic, but my general take is that uh, the reason why there must always be a Stark in Winterfell um, is because Winterfell is the crypt. Basically, you must always be um, putting your Starks down there. You must always be creating your statues. Um, the statues are a fascinating thing because every single time somebody goes down into the crypts, they are anthropomorphized to a ridiculous extent. And what I mean by that is 
if you look at that cha early chapter when you get um, Ned and Robert going in there, I think it's something like eight or nine times in the space of two or three pages where you get the statues as if they're alive. The statues are staring at them. They, they're watching them as they go past. Their shadows shift as if they were moving. Um, uh, the, they, Ned can feel them judging him. The, and this isn't just that one time there. Theon thinks the same thing. Um, John thinks the same thing. The, the statues, whenever they appear... The, the impression is that they are living in some way. Now, they've clearly been held down there in some way too. And if we are to take Winterfell as this kind of like defense against the others, uh, we could say, and let's not forget this, so these things sound crazy until you realize this is a high map by this point we're reaching a really high magic story um we've already got walking you know walking dead and dragons and and who knows what else um my best guess is that you get the horn of winter we're told that it um we're told two things that it has one potentially it brings down the wall it was blown once before and as far as we can tell, the wall wasn't brought down. And secondly, it brings giants, it raises giants from the earth. Now, this is a really intriguing idea. So the Horn of Winter is blown and giants rise from the earth. Those statues are not normal human size. If you ever go to and read the descriptions of those statues uh, down in the Winterfell crypts, they're really, they're high. You're never looking them in the eye. They're always looking down on you. Um, uh, they you know, reach out and touch a knee of, of one of them. These are giant statues. And what if the Horn of Winter, its role is to be raising the kings of winter. One other little bit of evidence. This was blown once before with the 13th Lord Commander. If that did what we think it does, which is raise the Starks from the dead, then from the, the Stark statues from the, the crypts, then we would expect the, the really oldest section of the Winterfell crypts not to have any statues in. And what do we hear? The very oldest section is inaccessible. We can't go and see it. So that's my, it's a working hypothesis. We don't have all of the direct evidence for it, but it fits absolutely everything as far as I'm concerned. I think that that is what we will see happen is that the statues, uh, if, yeah, if the bones get buried in there, the statues will rise and fight against the others. Uh, Cast Ballerina, uh, all brand tinfoil. Um, every Brandon Stark is a reincarnation of the original Brandon. We never see more than one of them at the same time, basically, Durin. Um, I mean, this is at the very least what George R. Martin is doing. Well, he's doing a very basic thing, which is basing these kinds of things in realism of sort of. Western European monarchies in that they have favourite names. There are eight Henrys, eight, eight Edwards um, uh, in the British royal family. There were loads of Louis uh, over in France. There, there were favourite names uh, which were used by families and that's what George R. Martin has tried to do here is to say, well, Bran is the favourite name for uh, the Starks. So that's one level. Um, uh, another level um, is this idea that the, the Starks are linked to worship of the old gods, the Weirwoods, and we understand how the Weirwoods don't see things as time. We're, we're told this, that they don't see time as sort of like this 
flowing thing that we are going through. You can see it at any given point. You can access it at any given point. You don't exist in moving through just in one direction. You can see all these different things at the same point in the same way that Bran could see through the Winterfell weirwood tree the same view, but at different points in time. That's what's happening with the brands. It's the same thing, but happening at different points in time. Whether they are actually reincarnated, I haven't seen the evidence. Um, and we have POV chapters for Bran, and at no point other than when he is walk, um, going back through the Weirwood Network in time, at no point has there been a hint that he's the same character as you know, a previous Bran other than old man teasing him about it. Um, Callie Summers, could Benjen, if he's turned like Cold Hands, retaining memory, be able to get through the night fort door? Maybe Cold Hands meant coming through would break the barrier. You need a white and black brother. Um, the, the implication is that it's the... the being dead thing, which is preventing you go through. Cold Hands was, as far as we can tell, a member of the Night's Watch. So um, uh, him going through would break the barrier. Mm, I mean, maybe, but that he doesn't seem to be saying it like... He, he seemed to be just, uh, I just can't go through. Um, if It's possible that yeah, if Benjamin has in, been cold handsified, and however that is, um, I think he would face the same problems as cold hands. Um, let's go to um, question from and Kelly Summers. Thank you. I did enjoy the tin foil. Um, uh, the Travis. Given how independent the North in general and the Stark specifically are, why did they never rebel against the Targaryens after the dragons were gone? They had no marriage ties of any kind to link them to the Targaryens that I remember. No, um, but this is where we come into this um, actual real life of what happened with the Starks. Uh, Craig and Stark, um, who basically agreed swore loyalty to uh, um, to them and put Aegon III on the throne, survived all the way through Aegon III's reign and through to the other side. So there was no reason for him to be rebelling against the king that he put on the throne, basically. Um, then we get Diran the I, uh, who didn't survive all that long, and uh, by the time we're moving beyond that, we're then starting to head into this Stark succession crisis, where um, I think he was called Rickon, actually, um, the the son of Cregan Stark, who had been the one who had been promised he was going to be marrying the Targaryen. He died in Diran the First's um, invasion of Dawn, so they were heavily involved in this. A, a Stark was down there attacking Dawn uh, with the Targaryens. Uh, but when he died, it was then his half-brothers that they were the problem uh, that followed. So we have um, the next 100 years or so of Starks infighting, um, uh, dying, new ones coming in. They could not focus in on what's going on down in the south, really. Um, it's only when we suddenly got uh, all the way through to uh, Rickard that you have this, how can we rebel against the, um, the Targaryens? And we don't know the full extent of the uh, Southron ambitions, but I think that the clear implication is that... Um, it, it, this wasn't a matter of let's just kick the Targaryens off. It was a how do we grab more power for the Starks? Um, let's go to uh, Courtney. What, if anything, do we know about Ned, Brandon, Lyanna, and Benjamin's mother? Great question. 
Um, not a lot is the answer. Liara was her name. So Liana is presumably named after her. Um, she was a first cousin once removed um, of Ricard, uh, which I think she was one generation up. So she was probably a bit older. Uh, we don't know ages, but she was probably a little bit older than Ricard. And um, so she very probably died when the kids were young, certainly before Robert's Rebellion. She was um, uh, she was a Stark, but also a Flint, I think. Um, and beyond that, we don't really know anything. Uh, so uh, it's it's noticeable that the Starks, because the Starks don't really have female rulers at any point, we read a sh not much about Stark women other than um, the ones just in this last two generations. Um, Commander Ray saying, uh, could I elaborate and discuss thoughts on Sansa and the theory of her three suitors leading to the John Sansa theory? And if you think it's a real possibility, even you think it will happen. Now, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think you're referring to um, the um, Tonya Ashford Meadow theory of Sansa's suitors, which is... Uh, this this was doing the rounds a few years ago. It's a fun theory. Um, I don't really support it, but um, it's 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 certainly interesting. Now the theory goes that uh, Sansa has uh, by this point had um, four suitors, as it were. Um, first of all, we've got Joffrey Baratheon. Um, then after that, uh, we had, um, uh, potential, what's his name? Tyrell. I was talking about him a bit earlier, uh, but the Tyrell heir. Um, then, um, we have Tyrion, who she's actually married to. And then we have, um, Harry Harding, Harry the heir, um, who Littlefinger is basically trying to get her engaged to. Now, that set of four names, Baratheon, Tyrell, Lannister and Harding, exists somewhere else in uh, the world of Ice and Fire, and it exists in the Tony Ashford Meadow, the very first Duncan Egg story, The Hedge Knight, you remember there was this tourney with some rather odd rules. And the rules were that uh, you get this fair maiden who has uh, five champions and knights could come and challenge her champions. Uh, and at the end of it, you would you would win if you you were one of her champions at the end of it. Now, the champions at the end of it were Lionel Baratheon, Leo Tyrell, Tybalt Lannister, Humphrey Harding, and Prince Valar Targaryen. So, Baratheon, Tyrell, Lannister, Harding, the same sequence of names of uh, Sansa's suitors so far. And who's the fifth on there? It's a Targaryen. So, uh, this theory goes that... Um, Sansa's fifth suitor is going to be John, because John's not really her half brother. Uh, he's actually a Targaryen. Um, do I buy into that? No. Uh, I think you could possibly make an argument for what about Fagon? When he arrives, um, the the thought has to be maybe he should try and marry Daenerys if she's about to also come and invade. But if not, who is the most eligible woman in all of Westeros? It's probably Sansa at this point. Uh, so could he be a suitor for her? 
it's possible. But do I think George R. R. Martin uh, has gone through and given us these uh, clues to who is going to be Sansa's suitors in a, a short story for Duncan Egg? No, I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting and fun theory, but I, I think it's just coincidence, sadly. Um, let me just very quickly say, I wish I got, I don't have it to hand. Two weeks ago, I had my Christmas merch with me. Um, if you want Christmas merch, it's, it's a really fun uh, Christmas jumper or um, sweater, I think you call it in America, um, in Deep Geek, but with lots of Christmassy stuff on it. Um, you should be able to see it. They're down there somewhere. There should be a link to um, shop where you can get it. If you would like to get some Christmas merch, that is the best way to do it. Um, and while I think of it, next week I'm probably going to do my Christmas charity special. Um, so uh, I will probably be wearing my Christmas um, uh, special outfit there. Anyway, uh, let's go back. I've got a few more questions to get. Oh, I've been going quite a long time, um, but I'm happy to carry on if you are. Um, Corvus Codex. Hey, Robert, when in doubt, blame Bloodraven. Absolutely. Also, merch, if you're interested. Um, we lost a lot of Starks in quick succession just before and during A Song of Ice and Fire, and we'll likely lose Rickon soon. Do you think it's viable that Bloodraven, Bloodravened them in order to purge the male Starks down to Bran? We know he'll be a king-like figure at the end of the story. My tiny tinfoil is that Bran's reason for rejecting the tree wizard life is that he le learns that Blood Raven was pulling the strings behind so many stark deaths. Um, okay, it's it's really I always in favour of blaming Blood Raven for things. Um, in terms of winnowing the line down to just Bran, I don't. Um, personally, I don't see the advantage in that because he was just going to find Bran and then uh, contact him through weirwood dreams, basically. So I don't think he needs to be killing lots of Starks for that. It is noticeable that lots of Starks do die um, in the period leading up to all of this, though. Um, again, my query is what the advantage is here for... Blood Raven, unless he's got a very clear idea on who should be the parentage that leads to Lyanna, um, in the same way that he seems to be um, very clearly trying to uh, make sure that the parentage that leads to um, John on his Targaryen side is uh, is exactly how he wants it surely he would also care about the Stark side. But we don't know enough about their deaths or, frankly, even who everybody was married to to actually get a very clear understanding of what kind of bloodlines Bloodraven might actually be trying to achieve. Um, uh, agree, we would saying Bloodraven winnowed to the Targs, why not the Starks? Yeah, so that's the, that's the main point. Um, uh, so... It, he could have done. We just don't have the evidence because we don't have. We don't know enough about the stocks. Brandy eighteen forty two saying winter is coming. Is this a threat to all that the Stark family has a strong connection to winter and possibly the others? I see it as a warning to all rather than a threat to all. I think it's the winter is coming, so you better prepare. Um, it's not. It's 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 been noted by lots of people that most of the the house um, words. Uh, are brags in some way. Um, ours is the fury, um, or we do not sow, which it doesn't sound too bad until you realise that what they actually mean is that we're just going to come and grab everything. We're not going to do any farming. We'll take what we want. Um, it's bragging. It's showing off. Uh, we grow strong. Um, it's quite a weak brag, but um, uh, it's also... A bit of a brag whereas winter is coming is a warning it's not showing off about the house in some way so i think that's showing the starks are slightly different here um 
Nicole Nark saying, happy Thursday, Robert, and to you too. Uh, in the show, all of the Stark children met back up at Winterfell, save Rickon, who only briefly saw Sansa and Jon. Do you think something similar will happen in the books? Will all of the Stark children be together again? How do you see them all arriving at Winterfell, if so? Well, yeah, again, this comes back to this, um, <clears throat> the, the end point of the Rob Stark's will video which I'm obviously spoiling, which is coming out tomorrow, um, is that what Rob Stark obviously wanted to do was to get rid of any um, uncertainty about who should be taking over after him by having a will. However, probably there's going to be more uncertainty than he could possibly imagine. Every single one of these Stark, other Starks could well have a claim and... Um, somebody in their corner pushing it uh, which by which i mean um we've got lady stoneheart who is actively hunting for Arya, uh because as far as she's concerned sansa can't inherit bran uh, bran and rickon are both dead therefore Arya is the heir we have got um lord manderley who has uh, sent davos off to get rickon uh, so that he can put Rickon back into Winterfell. We've got um, all of the people who uh, signed or, or um, witnessed Rob Stark's will, uh, or at least some of them, will be there saying, well, he's decided he's going to legitimise John, and that makes John the heir, because that's what happened. Um, then you've got Littlefinger, who is almost certainly going to have a look at the chaos and go, right, I'm diving in here. Um, and he's going to try and get Sansa into the equation and push her claim. And then Bran will probably come back. And some people are going to go, well, hang on a moment. He was at Rob's heir. Um, and so none of the rest of them actually matter if he's still alive. So we're going to get all of these Starks who are, even if they personally are not pushing their claim, they will have people pushing their claim for them. Are they all going to descend on Winterfell? I think probably yes. I think that Bran is going to head back to Winterfell. That's the most obvious place for him to head back from. I don't think he's going to stay north of the wall for the rest of the story. I think he's going to come back. John was wanting to go to Winterfell before he got killed so i think there's every reason why when he comes back he will want to go to winterfell rickon is being brought to winterfell um littlefinger will take sansa to winterfell uh and that the only person that leaves is Arya. and Arya, it's very noticeable when you're reading her particularly her early chapters in bravos it's very clear that the reason she's there is because she thinks that all of her family are gone. There's nowhere else for her. She's lost everything. She's lost her father. She's lost her mother. She's lost um, uh, her brothers. Um, her sister being you know, is trapped in uh, King's Landing as far as she's aware. She can't go there. She lost uh, Sarah Farrell, she's lost the Hound, all of these other kind of mentor figures that have been around there. John has gone up to the wall. Uh, there is nowhere for her. And that's why she's gone to Bravos. If she discovers that actually the Starks are back, I think she'll head back. She will reclaim her Stark identity and she will head back. Um... Mara Lee, who do you think will finally be Warden of the North at the end of the series? Do you think it will be Sansa Stark, like on the TV show, or someone different? Um, I, I think of all of them, um, Sansa is the most obvious. <laughs> it's, it's the short answer here. I, I think, so, um, I don't think Bran will want to be Lord of Winterfell. I think Rickon will be too young, but probably also too dead to do it. Um, Arya never has wanted to be a noble lady, so she won't want to do it. I think that Jon's story arc does end up with him leaving Westeros, heading north. That that 
as a story arc works really well for me. And Sansa's story arc naturally does seem to be heading to her going back to Winterfell. She starts it at Winterfell wanting to be away, having these ideas of what the rest of the world is and how terrible Winterfell is. But her journey has been getting her to a position where she's now starting to long for Winterfell. And she realised how safe it was there. And she realised what it was like having a family there around her. And she's seen the outside world and it's dangerous and she doesn't like it. And so her character arc is taking her back to Winterfell. And fundamentally, for some, for a character who has been used and abused by people all the way through her character arc, she will, and, and as we've gone through her suitors, as I've, I sort of called them, um, uh, the, this, this is a parade of people that other people are trying to get her to marry. Um, she, her best place for her is to actually be the ruling lady and she can be in charge of her own fate. And that is a character arc that works really well for her. So of all the characters, I think the one that it works best for from what we've seen so far is Sansa. Um, Curse Ballerina saying, Brandon Ice Eyes is sus. <laughs> Bolton or other blood? Um, uh, yeah, it's possible. So Brandon Bright Ice Eyes... Um, the Starks generally have grey eyes and they can, uh, but as we've seen with the Stark children that we have at the moment, some of them can have red hair um, when they marry into a family with red hair. So it makes sense that Ice Eyes, um, yeah, married maybe married a Bolton or something like that. That would make sense. Um uh, last question from my patrons, but I will try and pick up another couple of questions in the chat. So if you've got any more, now is a chance to drop them in there. Uh, Johnny Sariani saying, greetings, Robert. This is my, and greetings to you. This is my first question in quite a while, but I'm glad to be back. It's good to see you. In the show, we saw the North seceding from the Seven Kingdoms. Do you believe this will happen in the books as well? And as a follow-up, do you think this is a good move geopolitically? The North has always been different than the other kingdoms, but the same can be said about Dawn. Would it make more sense if there were three separate countries in Westeros? Or perhaps even revert back, revert back to all the kingdoms being independent? Okay, so um, at the end of the TV show, yes, they seceded um, from the Seven Kingdoms. Now, um this is this is a bit of a, a sort of a, a a weird thing because they in in the books then they it is still depending on your perspective it is still independent because they were you know, rob was the kingdom it was the king of the north and the riverlands and so uh, or the trident i think they called him uh so they are already independent. And if he has given that, if he's passed that on to John, then that makes John the king of the North and the Trident. Uh, but if Stannis is still around, to Stannis, it might just be Lord of Winterfell. And the Lannisters wouldn't recognise it at all. So the legal situation will be a little bit weird when we get to the end. Uh, it will does it make geopolitical sense i mean maybe they they do seem to be different they have their own religion and traditions in the north similarly dawn similarly the iron islands the rest very broadly particularly if the targaryens have gone uh, very broadly andal influenced so you could sort of split it up that way i guess um uh, but yeah, I don't. I, I think we cannot say for sure unless we know what the situation is at the end. And I suspect that really what we're going to get is, I mean, we might learn this, but we're actually going to have um, a continent in absolute ruins. And 
probably the priority should not be let's just try and establish where the geopolitical borders are um it should be how on earth do we feed people and just keep this show on the road uh, so uh, it really depends on at which point in time george r martin decides to actually end the story um right let's just go quickly into the chat uh, Mara Lee, hi there, Mara, uh, saying, didn't miss it, yeah, I'm, I'm very nearly finished, uh, Mara, uh, and Super Chat saying, for the direwolves, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Karl Karsnack saying, Rikon means powerful ruler in German, Rikon Stark equals powerful, strong ruler, foreshadowing maybe, um, yeah, I can't see that he's going to be doing much ruling, it has to be said, Andrew K. Um, uh, on Ned's view of Rhaegar, the fact that he blames Lyanna's spirit more than Rhaegar and doesn't think ill of him says a lot. Would be like Robert Baratheon killing him in his dreams if it was so sinister. Um, it, yeah, absolutely. It, Ned's lack of disliking Rhaegar is incredibly telling, it has to be said. Uh, Chris Bellarina saying, do I think Sansa gets to walk a bird well so she is called little bird um and she does stare at the birds out of the wind i think they're eagles at the eerie um so if she's going to she's not getting a dire wolf back so if she's going to walk into something then that's probably the most likely um and uh is it quick <laughs> it's great on saying marrying a bolton sounds crazy yep yeah, absolutely um it, it definitely does but that doesn't mean that they didn't do it okay um and with that i'm going to start drawing this one to a close but uh, a few things just to say i'm going to do one more live stream uh, this year which is next week that will be my um christmas charity special um when I'm back in the new year, we will finish off doing the North. Uh, we're going to do two more weeks in the North. I'm going to look at the Night's Watch one week, which is technically not a house, but, you know, I think it's a good topic for us to be looking at. And then uh, secondly, a sort of a roundup of all of the uh, the rest of the um, uh, the houses in the North. Um, uh, what else, as I say, I've got um, the Rob Stark's Will video coming out tomorrow and... Um, I'm sure another another one that I liked coming out. I can't remember. Just keep on checking the channel. You'll find them. Um, you can also find me just in case you want to follow me in, in other places. Uh, feel free to check out. I'm, I'm on TikTok now, uh, as well as Instagram and Facebook and X and probably a few other places. So if you find it easier to follow me on those other places, please do so there. But um, uh, for this time... Uh, appearing somewhere up here um, will be a link to other live streams that I have done. Appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to my Patreon page, which is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. That is all for this time. Take care, everyone, and I will see you again next week. <laughs>